Number 9. Sigfredo Garcia Luis Rivera and Catherine Magbanua on July the 18th of 2014. Law professor Dan Markle was talking on the phone as he parked his car in the garage of his Tallahassee home. Markle's keys were still in the ignition when he was approached by a gunman and shot twice in the head. A neighbor who'd heard the gunshots called the emergency services and Markle was transported to the hospital where he passed away the next day. The neighbor told the police he'd seen a light-colored Toyota Prius drive away from the professor's home after the incident. During the ensuing investigations, police discovered that a light green Prius had been following Markle around the day he was killed and managed to track the car to Miami. While the vehicle was stopped at a drive through bank in South Florida, surveillance cameras captured Luis Rivera behind the wheel with Sigfredo Garcia in the passenger seat. At first, police believed the man's killing might have been ordered by his former wife, Wendy Adelson, or her family. They even drafted an arrest affidavit for her brother, but prosecutors declined to press charges due to a lack of evidence. Eventually, the investigation led the authorities to Catherine Magbanua, whom they believed had been used by Adelson's brother to intermediate hiring Garcia and Rivera for the murder. Detectives suspected the motive had been to allow Wendy Adelson to relocate hers and Markle's children to Miami after she'd been prohibited from doing so following their divorce. Magbanua was arrested and charged with murder on October the 1st of 2016. Three days later, Luis Rivera pleaded guilty to the charge of murder as part of a plea bargain and was sentenced to 19 years in prison. Rivera confessed his crime revealing that Garcia had recruited him and that Magbanua had been the woman in the middle doing everything. Garcia was found guilty of first-degree murder and conspiracy, which resulted in a sentence of life in prison on October the 15th. As of the latest updates on the matter, Magbanua remained in jail charged as a co-conspirator as the jury wasn't able to reach a verdict in her case, and her trial was rescheduled for May the 16th of 2022. Number 8. Ricky Dealey on October the 10th of 2019, Ricky Dealey, along with Caitlin Spruill and Logan Tyndale, both aged 20, were intercepted by police in traffic in Marion County. After asking for their documents, officers discovered 34-year-old Dealey, who was behind the wheel, had a suspended driver's license. The investigation also revealed that Tyndale, who'd lied about his name when originally questioned, had a felony warrant out for his arrest. The police officers searched the vehicle and found a bag containing 23 grams of methamphetamine, 20 methylene pills, cocaine, marijuana, a digital scale, and a handgun. All three suspects were taken into custody and transported to the Marion County Jail, where they had their mugshots taken. The photographs were later published on Marion County Sheriff's Office social media account and became viral, particularly due to Dealey's distinctive physical appearance, which sharply contrasted that of his fellow accused. His photo was shared thousands of times with the most common comments, comparing Dealey's features to those of Shrek, Dumbo, or an extraterrestrial. Some remarked upon the difference between his mugshot and that of Jeremy Meeks's, who'd gone viral as the hot felon in the mid-2010s and began a modeling career upon his release from prison. Another mugshot featuring Dealey was disseminated online in early 2020, along with Alice Christina Noel and Estelle Albert Garwood III, aged 41 and 38 respectively. He'd been suspected of burglarizing a house in Ocala. The latter two were apprehended while Dealey fled into a wooded area where, after refusing to obey police commands, he was taken into custody with the help of a K-9 unit that bit into him. Number 7. George Jolicoeur in April of 2020, George Jolico, aged 38, was found guilty of scamming restaurants out of food. The man, described by media outlets as morbidly obese, had managed to trick the staff of a restaurant into giving him several free milkshakes. He'd done so by complaining the milk had been spoiled after consuming the whole drink. He was caught on a different occasion after he'd ordered $50 worth of beef jerky from a restaurant. The man ended up eating only a few strips of the jerky, sent the food back, claiming it was bad, and then left without paying. The jerky store staff called the police and officers tracked him down to his home in Sanford. Officers reported that as they went inside to arrest him, they first heard a man trying to impersonate a feminine voice, 
claiming Jolicoeur wasn't home. Afterwards, they heard an actual woman shouting at him to surrender himself. The man was arrested and pleaded guilty to five charges, but escaped jail time due to being severely overweight. Prosecutors claimed Jolicoeur had his own prison cell at home because he was bedridden and had to have a respirator near to aid him with breathing. The man couldn't physically attend court to be sentenced and prosecutors also determined it would cost thousands in medical fees just to bring him before a judge. So he was ultimately sent off with a fine. Number 6. Otis Dwayne Ryan On May the 20th of 2018, police responded to reports of a man displaying disturbing behavior at a Clearwater Beach playground. Officers that arrived at the scene found that 30-year-old Otis Dwayne Ryan had climbed atop a piece of playground equipment and was yelling at children nearby. Ryan was reportedly explaining to them that babies came out of women and was using vulgar terms while addressing four and six-year-olds. Police were called by outraged parents who told officers that the man had also caused a number of other disturbances in the area. He'd allegedly been making inappropriate comments to women on the street in an effort to get confronted by their male partners. Ryan was arrested on a charge of disorderly conduct, found guilty and fined $118. He was subsequently ordered to stay away from the park. Number 5. Patrick Florence Deputies with the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office stopped a vehicle in Clearwater at around 4 a.m. on December the 18th of 2021. After noticing it didn't have its headlights or taillights on, officers then searched the car and found a gun underneath the passenger seat, where 34-year-old Patrick Florence was sitting. The discovery prompted law enforcement members to also search Florence, which led them to finding two baggies strapped to his manhood. One of them was later revealed to contain cocaine and the other methamphetamine. Florence was arrested and charged with possession of cocaine, meth, ammunition, and a firearm. In spite of the stark inculpatory evidence before his arrest, Florence denied the drugs and gun were his, but didn't mention to whom they belonged. According to public records, the man had been arrested several times in the past, with the majority of the incidents involving cocaine or crack cocaine charges. The driver, 27-year-old Darius Owens, was also arrested on charges of driving under the influence and marijuana possession. Number 4. Tinsley Mortimer On April the 9th of 2016, socialite and TV personality Tinsley Mortimer showed up uninvited at the Palm Beach home of her former boyfriend, 30-year-old billionaire heir Alexander Nico Fanjul. They had recently ended their relationship after three years of dating on and off. Fanjul's new girlfriend was also present at the address. At first, 40-year-old Mortimer claimed that she only wanted to retrieve her purse from inside the man's home, but her ex-boyfriend maintained he didn't have it. Unhappy with the situation, Mortimer refused to leave the premises and started screaming at Fanjul, who was still inside the house at that time. The man called the police to have her removed from his property. When officers arrived, they reportedly found Mortimer screaming and crying. They repeatedly tried to calm her down but were unable to convince her to leave and consequently placed her under arrest for trespassing. Mortimer was released on her own recognizance after spending three hours in custody. Number 3. Tabitha Riatano After partying all night with her friends on July the 29th of 2018, a teenager was caught driving under the influence of alcohol in Dade County. 19-year-old Tabitha Riatana was taken into custody and allegedly behaved violently towards an officer. As they were attempting to arrest her, Riatana was transported to a local police station and booked on multiple charges. As her mugshots were being taken, the teenager struck different poses, sticking out her tongue at the camera while being photographed from the front and flashing a smile as she was being photographed from the side. The photos earned attention online, and as argued by the processing police officers, Riatano seemed completely unbothered by her predicament. She pleaded not guilty to the charges of battery, disorderly intoxication, and resisting an officer with violence. The young woman was freed on a $3,500 bond and scheduled for a court appearance. Number 2. Garrett James Smith Garrett James Smith was spending his 22nd birthday by attending a rally outside the Pernellas County Justice Center in protest of a local Capitol riot participant's arrest on January the 6th of 2022. He was wearing black clothing, a black balaclava, and a backpack. 
Smith triggered the police's suspicions when he seemed to have been spooked by something and sprinted away from the rally. Officers intercepted him and, while searching his backpack, they found he was carrying a homemade pipe-style bomb, a combat helmet, and a handwritten action plan. Smith was arrested on charges of loitering, as well as making and possessing a destructive device. The authorities found no criminal history or social media presence when probing Smith's background, making him a sleeper suspect, arguably the most worrisome profile as the police really have a chance to prevent any potential criminal action. During the investigations that followed, police obtained a search warrant for the man's house, where they discovered another homemade bomb, hand grenade-style explosives, nails, and duct tape. While his parents cooperated with the authorities, Smith refused to answer the officers' questions and sought the protection of the Fifth Amendment. In February, after further inquiries in the matter, prosecutors decided not to pursue charges of making and possessing an explosive device anymore, with the authorities claiming that the homemade items Smith had been carrying were legal. Experts believe that if they were to be lit, they would cause smoke, but not an explosion. However, 22-year-old Smith still faced the charge of loitering and prowling. Number 1. Madison Mergel and Stephen Solstad On February the 2nd of 2021, Madison Mergel and Stephen Solstad entertained an unnamed 50-year-old man at their home in Key West. He'd met up with the couple to smoke marijuana and when he got into his car to leave, fell asleep because the marijuana had allegedly been laced with other substances. When he woke up, Mergel and Solstad entered his car and forced him to move into the passenger seat. 31-year-old Solstad allegedly punched and threatened the victim with a razor, holding him hostage. He and his girlfriend, aged 22, took control of the car and drove to a bank drive through The couple tried to force their victim to withdraw cash, but he maintained not being able to do that because he didn't have his ID with him. Security camera footage from the bank confirmed the victim's allegations. Mergel and Solstad then drove to the 50-year-old's home while continuing to threaten him with a knife and forcing him to do more drugs in order to keep him incapacitated. When they arrived at the man's residence, the couple spent approximately 24 hours there and reportedly continued drugging him up throughout the entire day. The victim said he was unsure of the substances he had been given and sought medical attention when Mergel and Solstad finally left his house, taking his car along with other valuable belongings, including several smartphones and $150. Police apprehended them in Palm Beach County and both faced charges of kidnapping, aggravated assault, robbery, grand theft, and grand theft of a motor vehicle. Number 8. Arrest of Karen Garner On January the 26th of 2020, Karen Garner left a Walmart in Loveland without paying for items that amounted to nearly $14. 73-year-old Garner suffered from dementia and sensory aphasia, a condition that involves sufferers not understanding written or spoken language. Staff followed her out and took the items from her, refused to allow her to pay for them and called the police after Garner pulled off an employee's face mask. Police later found the elderly woman picking wildflowers from a field on the side of the road. First-year officer Austin Hopp aggressively moved in to arrest Garner, who was frightened and confused. Hopp forcefully pulled her arms backwards and handcuffed her. On multiple occasions, the woman said, I am going home, only to be repeatedly thrown to the ground by Hopp, even though she only weighed around 80 pounds. Third-year officer Daria Jalali came to assist Hopp and helped him hold Garner against the hood of the squad car. They ultimately hogtied the elderly woman. A bystander who questioned the officer's aggression was ordered to leave the area. The senior citizen suffered a dislocated shoulder, a fractured arm, a sprained wrist, and bruises all over her body. The arrested officers failed to provide her with medical care for six hours after she was taken into custody. To make matters worse, video surveillance from the station would capture Hop and Jalali laughing and fist bumping as they watched the body cam footage from the arrest. They believed that they'd crushed it and Hop described the sound that Garner's shoulder had made when he'd dislocated it. Garner's family sued the officers for use of excessive force, and her attorneys released the body cam footage, as well as the surveillance footage from the station on YouTube, prompting a public outcry. In the aftermath, Hop and Jalali resigned and were charged by state prosecutors with a number of offenses, including second-degree assault and official misconduct. Number 7. Kelsey Berrith 29-year-old Kelsey Berrith was last seen on Thanksgiving Day 2018 in the area of her Woodland Park home. At the time, she was in the company of her fiancé, Patrick Frazee, who was also the father of her one-year-old daughter. 
The police found evidence of foul play and about a month after Berith's disappearance. They arrested 33-year-old Frazee as the main suspect in her murder. He maintained that he was innocent, but a series of gruesome revelations followed. The key witness in the case was his ex-girlfriend, Crystal Lee, with whom he was reportedly having an affair. Under a plea deal, Lee told the court that on Thanksgiving Day, she'd received a call from Frazee, telling her that there was a mess at Berith's home, which she needed to clean up. Lee arrived to find blood on the living room floor, splattered on the walls, on kitchen appliances, stuffed animals, and other home items. It took Lee four hours to clean up the crime scene, claiming she'd done so out of fear that Frazee would hurt her family. Berith's remains were never found as according to Lee, they took the body back to Frazee's ranch and burned it. Frazee opened up to Lee about the murder. He'd blindfolded Berith with a sweater, under the guise that he would have her guess the smell of scented candles. Then, as their young daughter sat in a back room, Frazee beat Berith to death with a baseball bat. The motive remains unclear, but it's been speculated as a breakup, and Frazee wanting to avoid a custody battle. He was ultimately sentenced to life in prison, plus 156 years. Number 6. David Smith In 2016, a South Dakota man died after being struck by an avalanche near Wolf Creek Pass in southern Colorado. 23-year-old David Smith was snowmobiling with three companions when he got stuck in a gully and triggered the slide on an eastern portion of the pass. The group was caught in the avalanche with Smith being completely buried under the hard-packed snow. A second snowmobiler was also partially trapped but managed to break free. The slide occurred at around 4 p.m. and the group went to find emergency assistance but didn't get a cell phone signal until about two hours later. A rescue effort was mounted by local authorities and other riders, but Smith had already succumbed to his injuries by the time that help arrived. Number 5. Suzanne Morphew Nearly a year after she'd gone missing on Mother's Day 2020, the authorities arrested a man for the suspected murder of 49-year-old Suzanne Morphew. Her disappearance was reported by a neighbor after she'd gone for a bike ride and never returned to her 1.7 million Chaffee County mansion. Suzanne's husband, 52-year-old Barry, was on a work trip to Denver, and he told the authorities that she was asleep at around 5 a.m. when he left. He offered a $100,000 reward, which was matched by a family friend, and put out an emotional video on social media, pleading for the mother of two safe return while holding back tears. Yet as the investigation progressed, Barry became the primary suspect in the disappearance of his wife. It was revealed that she'd been having an extramarital affair for nearly two years with a high school friend and that in April, they'd been talking about moving to Ecuador together. Text exchanged between Suzanne and her friends also indicated that she no longer felt safe around Barry, who had allegedly shoved her and held a gun to her head. On the day that his wife was reported missing, Barry was seen dumping items in various suburban Denver trash containers, a total of five times. He reportedly had no reaction upon being shown surveillance photos of him doing so by the authorities. Cell phone data placed this truck in the area from where his wife's bicycle was later recovered. Suzanne's body was never found and the case is ongoing, but if found guilty, Barry could be sentenced to life in prison. Number 4. Moose Trampling in March of 2020, a woman was attacked by a young moose bull near Breckenridge after she'd gotten too close to it. The unnamed victim, reported as being in her 50s, spotted the moose at around 6 p.m. as it was blocking some residents from getting out of their vehicle. She approached it and tried to guide it away only to be charged by the massive animal. The woman was brutally trampled and suffered several broken bones. She was taken to a local hospital where doctors were able to stabilize her condition and she was eventually able to give her account of the incident to wildlife officers. They euthanized the bull in accordance to agency regulations, as most research indicates that once a wild animal displays aggression and attacks a human, it's likely to happen again. Number 3. Jepsi Kalungi Dane and Jepsi Kalungi met through a dating app in 2017 and got married after the latter moved to Colorado Springs from the Philippines. The wedding took place two years after Dane's first marriage had ended in divorce. 28-year-old Jepsy was last seen alive in March of 2019, with her family reporting her missing the following month after she'd gone silent in their online communication. When questioned by the police, Dane claimed that he didn't know anything about her whereabouts. He stated that on March the 20th between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m., she'd left him after they'd had a fight. Dane told officers 
that he'd found text messages between her and someone named Travis, who she was planning to meet. Investigators later learned that he was one of two soldiers at Fort Carson who Jepsy was seeing, but could tie neither man to her disappearance. The case went cold in January of 2020, and Dane moved to California. Officers interviewed him in San Diego about a cell phone tower ping that placed him in the same area as Jepsy's cell phone five days after their reported fight, but Dane invoked his Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. The police were suspicious of him after learning that he'd strangled his first wife, Elaine, on five to seven separate occasions. However, the break in the case didn't come until March of 2021. More than two years after Jepsy had gone missing, Elaine called a detective and told him that Dane was briefly returning to Colorado and that he'd asked if they could meet for lunch. She agreed and during the meetup, they had a conversation in which Dane confessed to her that he'd killed Jepsy. Several days later, Elaine set up a phone call with Dane while the detective was listening and recording. He revealed the full story of the killing and how he'd strangled Jepsy to literally stop the words from coming out of her mouth for a second. Dane then realized that he'd squeezed her throat for too long and had done some damage. He put her in the trunk of his car and drove to the Florissant area where he dug a hole as deep as he could until three in the morning. It was there that he dumped her body. Based on the recorded conversation, Dane was arrested in June of 2021 in Albuquerque. Number two, beer mauling in garage. In late May of 2021, a Colorado man was severely mauled by a beer in his garage near Steamboat Springs. The incident occurred at around 11 p.m. on a Sunday when the unnamed victim noticed the open garage door and went to close it. Inside, he saw a mother beer with two cups. The homeowner tried backing away, at which point the sow charged him, most likely as a way of protecting its young. The animal bit and clawed the man, inflicting deep cuts to his legs and head before fleeing the premises. He was rushed to a local hospital and required surgery, but was expected to survive. It was later revealed that the victim had stored birdseed and other items that could attract beers inside the garage. The sow was hunted down in the aftermath by wildlife officials, and traps were set up for the cubs, with the intention of relocating them. Number 1. United Bank Tower Robbery On Father's Day 1991, a violent bank robbery occurred at the United Bank Tower, currently called the Wells Fargo Center in Denver. The bank had recently changed its policy, requiring guards to be unarmed. At around 9 a.m., a man falsely claiming to be a vice president at the bank asked to enter through a side freight elevator. A guard rode the elevator up to meet him and was held at gunpoint when the doors opened. The guard was forced to take him to an area of the bank located below the basement. It was there that the robber killed the guard, hid his body in the storage room and made off with his access card. He then kept moving through the tunnels and reached the basement area, which housed the guard room and the vault. He killed three more guards, two of whom he ambushed inside their station and one who'd returned to it after hearing gunshots. Throughout the killing spree, he'd fired a total of 18 bullets on the guards, only one of which had failed to reach its targets. He then erased traces of his presence from the crime scene by removing his shell casings, pages from the guard logbooks and surveillance videotapes. The robber made his way into the vault where six tellers were processing cash deliveries. They were ordered to lie on the floor with their eyes closed and the senior vault manager was told to fill a satchel with cash from the workstations. One curious aspect was that only about $200,000 was taken even though $2 million were available in the cash room and vault. The tellers would later describe the suspect as a man in his 50s or 60s with a bandage on his cheek who was wearing mirrored sunglasses and a brown fedora along with a grey sports coat and blue or grey slacks. After the satchel was filled, the robber locked the employees into a man trap, an access room with interlocking doors and made his escape. In the ensuing investigation, the authorities focused their attention on James King, a retired Denver police officer and former guard at the bank. He'd left the job 10 months prior to the robbery and was in massive debt. A search of his home found no evidence to concretely link him to the crime. The only suspicious items were a detailed map of the bank in a folder marked plans, as well as several fake IDs showing King's picture and various aliases. The latter were dismissed by a judge since it couldn't be proven King had used the IDs illegally. A jury ultimately acquitted him of all charges after 53 hours of deliberations. The FBI kept King under surveillance for years after the trial, hoping more evidence would turn up, but nothing ever did. Number 8. Jennifer Levin On August 26, 1986, the lifeless body of 18-year-old Jennifer Levin was found in Central Park 
near 5th Avenue and 83rd Street. She was half naked and covered in bite marks, cuts and scratches. Her fingernails were bruised, suggesting she'd fought her killer. Levin's underwear was found 50 yards away from her body and it was later determined that she'd been fatally strangled. She'd last been seen leaving a bar called Dorian's Red Hand in the company of 19-year-old Robert Chambers. The police went to his home and found him with deep, fresh scratches, which he claimed had been inflicted by his cat before admitting that the pet had been declawed. He first denied leaving with Levin, but then upon being confronted with witness testimony, changed his story. Chambers then claimed that the young woman had left to buy cigarettes, but then recanted when told that Levin didn't smoke. His final version of events was that he'd killed her by accident while trying to push her off because she'd assaulted him as they were having relations in the park. The case would be known as the preppy murder due to the high status of both the victim and killer in the trial that followed. Chambers' legal team argued that he'd strangled Levin in self-defense during rough intercourse. His attorney would describe the young woman as promiscuous, claiming that she'd kept a diary of her relations and that her intimate history was admissible as evidence. After nine days of deliberation in 1988, the jury deadlocked. Under a plea bargain, Chambers admitted manslaughter in the first degree. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison and released in 2003. Then, in 2008, he was given a 19-year sentence on unrelated drug trafficking charges. Number 7. Paulie Velez Just before 7.20 a.m. on November the 11th of 2021, an unnamed female jogger was attacked as she ran on a footpath near Swan Lake and Woolman Rink. The assailant came up from behind, put her in a chokehold until she passed out and forced himself on her. He then made off with her phone. The authorities distributed photos of the suspect that they'd obtained from surveillance cameras and he was identified as 25-year-old Paulie Velez. A few days after the attack, the NYPD went to his mother's home in Howard Beach, Queens. The young man tried to escape by jumping fences, hiding under a deck and then leaping into a body of water. Officers used thermal imaging cameras to track him and eventually took him into custody. He was arraigned in Manhattan Supreme Court on a multiple count indictment that included robbery, abuse and strangulation. Velez admitted to the attack on the jogger, claiming he'd grabbed her body a little bit and slipped a finger in her. At the time of his latest offense, he was on probation for an eerily similar 2020 attack in Sunny Isles Beach, Florida. He'd taken a woman from a Miami sidewalk and dragged her to a darkened alley, where he put her in a chokehold and threatened to remove her pants. The attack was interrupted by two witnesses and Velez fled when the police arrived at the scene but was ultimately arrested on charges of battery and kidnapping. He was released on probation with an ankle monitor and shared selfies of himself wearing it on social media. Velez eventually cut off his monitor and fled to New York City, where he lived in a Brooklyn homeless shelter before committing the assault on the jogger. Number 6. Christian Cooper On May the 25th of 2020, Christian Cooper was birdwatching in an area of Central Park called The Ramble. Cooper, an African-American man in his late 50s, was involved in an argument with a woman named Amy Cooper. No relation. The dispute was sparked by the fact that the latter's dog was unleashed in violation of the Ramble's rules. Amy refused Christian's request to leash her dog, to which he responded by beckoning the pet in his direction with a treat. The woman began yelling at Christian to keep his distance, at which point he started recording her on his cell phone. He remained largely silent and calm as Amy pointed her fingers in his face, threatening to call the police. She was recorded saying, I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Amy was also seen dragging her cocker spaniel by its collar as it appeared to be straining and trying to get free. She followed up on her threats and Christian recorded her as she spoke to a 911 dispatcher asking for officers to be sent immediately. The video ended with him thanking her for finally leashing the dog and both Coopers left the park by the time that the police arrived. The clip was shared on social media and viewed tens of millions of times, with the public being widely critical of Amy's actions of falsely presenting herself as being in immediate danger, taking advantage of 
a tendency for people and police to treat black people with suspicion. Amy, who came to be known as the Central Park Karen, later apologized for her actions and maintained that she wasn't a racist. She was fired from her job at Franklin Templeton and later lost a lawsuit of wrongful termination launched against the company. Her dog was briefly removed from her but later returned. The woman was charged with filing a false report, but the case was dropped after she completed a five-session educational and therapeutic program focused on racial identity. Number 5. Maria Isabel Monteiro Alves Brazilian woman Maria Isabel Monteiro Alves was training for the New York City Marathon and running through Central Park on September the 17th of 1995. At around 6 a.m., Alves was ambushed under the cover of darkness and rain. She was dragged down an embankment to a glen where she was abused and bludgeoned to death. The 44-year-old was subsequently buried in her native Brazil. Her murder sparked sensational headlines and a plethora of tips, but her killer was never caught. On August the 2nd of 2016, jogger Karina Vetrano, aged 30, was killed in eerily similar circumstances in Spring Creek Park, as she was also training for a marathon. Vetrano's killer was ultimately identified as Chanel Lewis. The incident renewed interest in Alves's case resulted in detectives reopening files and interviewing witnesses once more. Several elements pointed to initial suspect Adolfo Martinez, at the time an itinerant can collector with a criminal past that included abuse as the perpetrator. He'd told a witness that a woman had been killed in the park hours before Alves was discovered. He'd been seen with blood on his hands and had earlier expressed an intention of stealing the jogger's Walkman. Martinez died of tuberculosis nearly two years after the killing. The case of Alves's death was closed in January of 2017 as homicide with exceptional clearance, meaning that the culprit was known but could no longer be prosecuted. Alves's 87-year-old mother, who was living in a suburb of Rio de Janeiro and had given up hope of the case being resolved, wept and repeatedly thanked detectives for learning the identity of her daughter's killer. Number 4. Taraka Larson Brooklyn musician Taraka Larson was walking through Central Park at around 9 p.m. on July the 30th of 2013 in the park near the pond by 59th Street. The 26-year-old came upon two small and scrawny raccoons, which she later noted were moving strangely. Larson stopped and tried not to startle them, hoping they would ignore her. But the animals approached her and started sniffing her foot. One of them then jumped, sunk its claws in her leg and started gnawing at it. Larson kicked the raccoon off and ran away, subsequently seeking help at the Plaza Hotel. She explained her situation and staff suggested she immediately head to the hospital and get treatment for rabies. Staff at Roosevelt Hospital asked the musician if it was possible that she'd misidentify the animal that had attacked her, asking if it might have been a squirrel or small dog instead. Larson, however, provided them with an Instagram photo of the raccoons, which she'd taken right before the attack. What had started off as a really nice summer walk ended with her getting multiple shots to fight a potential rabies infection. Number 3. Heidi Jones In late November of 2010, Heidi Jones, a meteorologist for WABC7 and Good Morning America, told the NYPD that she was being stalked by a Hispanic man, whom she also accused of assaulting her at an earlier date. The unidentified suspect reportedly approached her outside her home on November the 21st and threatened her. 37-year-old Jones claimed that the same man, whom she said was in his 30s or 40s, had tried to abuse her while she'd been out jogging in Central Park on the afternoon of September the 24th. He'd allegedly grabbed her from behind, dragged her into a wooded area and tried to force himself on her, but was ultimately scared off by two park visitors. Jones claimed that law enforcement had refused to take her initial reports of the assault, which prompted a personal call and apology from the police commissioner. Detectives made lengthy investigations, scoured surveillance video, and appealed for witnesses. Upon interviewing Jones again on December the 13th, they noted inconsistencies in her story. Jones broke down and admitted to have 
fabricated the whole ordeal, she told detectives. I did make this up. I made it up for attention, blaming stress from her work and personal life. In 2011, the forecaster, who'd since been terminated from her job, pleaded guilty to two misdemeanor counts of falsely reporting an incident. She was given three years probation, 250 hours of community service, and ordered to undergo mandatory psychiatric counseling. Number two, Trisha Miley and the Central Park Five. On April the 19th of 1989, Trisha Miley, a 28-year-old white woman, was brutally attacked while jogging through Central Park. She was found naked, gagged and bound while covered in blood and mud. In a shallow ravine about 300 feet north of a path called the 102nd Street Crossing, she'd been abused and nearly beaten to death. Her skull was fractured so badly that her left eye was loosened from its socket. She'd lost close to 80% of her blood and was suffering from severe hypothermia. Miali was given last rites as her wounds were expected to be fatal, but after spending 12 days in a coma, she woke up unable to read, walk or talk. The woman eventually recovered with some lingering disabilities related to loss of balance and vision, but had no memory of the attack. A group of over 30 youths had committed acts of violence in the park on the night and five black and Hispanic teenagers were eventually arrested for the attack on Miley. The group who'd come to be known as the Central Park Five consisted of Kevin Richardson, Raymond Santana, Antron McRae, Yusuf Salam, and Corey Wise. The teens were interrogated without their parents for hours before four of them gave videotaped confession that they'd been involved in the attack on Miley. DNA evidence from the scene didn't match any of them, so prosecutors relied solely on their confessions. Crime was rampant in New York City in the late 1980s, and the Central Park jogger case drew national interest as a pivotal example of the city's lawlessness, youth crime, and violence towards women. The five withdrew their admissions of guilt within weeks, claiming they'd been coerced into confessing by the NYPD. After two trials, they were found guilty of offenses that included attempted murder, assault and robbery, which resulted in convictions of 6 to 13 years in prison. In 2002, the real criminal, Matthias Reyes, came forward and took responsibility for abusing and beating Miley when he was in his teens, claiming it was the right thing to do. He gave specific details about the crime and his DNA was a match. He'd been found guilty of an assault two days before Miley, but was never a suspect in the Central Park jogger case and wasn't prosecuted after his admission because the statute of limitations had passed. The five were cleared of all charges after nearly serving their full sentences. They subsequently filed a civil suit against New York City, receiving $41 million in a settlement, and their story inspired the award-winning drama miniseries when they see us. Number one, Michael McMorrow. 44-year-old real estate agent Michael McMorrow encountered teenage couple Daphne Abdella and Christopher Vasquez in Central Park on May the 22nd of 1997. They convinced him to join them at the lake where they drank beer and malt liquor. Earlier in the evening, Abdella had reportedly told her friends, I'm going to kill someone tonight with Vasquez pledging his support. Abdella's parents had died when she was a child and she was eventually adopted by a wealthy New York City couple. The team was described as having a hair-trigger temper and was often hostile towards her adoptive family. She'd also developed a serious alcohol problem for which she went to rehab. Abdella met Vasquez while rollerblading through Central Park and they became inseparable. The former reportedly had a manipulative hold over Vasquez, an altar boy who didn't have friends and was clinging to her attention. In the most widespread version of events, at some point after reaching the lake with McMorrow, Abdella and Vasquez brandished knives and threatened him. The teens viciously stabbed and slashed McMorrow, with Abdella ordering her boyfriend to slice him from ear to ear. By the end of the attack, the man had been knifed over 30 times with his hands, nose and neck almost severed off. Abdella then told Vasquez to disembowel the victim after which they filled the body with rocks. She was quoted as saying, he's a fatty, he'll sink. The teens were found by the police, washing McMorrow's blood off in the basement of the pricey apartment building where Abdella and her family lived. They claimed to have fallen while rollerblading and the officers believed them. Abdella then called the NYPD 
and tried to give an anonymous tip that there was a body in Central Park Lake. But the call was traced to her home. Upon further interrogation, she immediately tried to pin the murder on Vasquez, claiming he'd killed McMorrow in a jealous outburst. The baby-faced butchers, as the media dubbed them in the aftermath, gave varied versions of events at their trial, with Vasquez maintaining that his girlfriend had dealt the fatal knife strikes. The jury struggled to determine which of them had been responsible, and they were both sentenced to 10 years in prison for manslaughter. They only served six years of their sentences and were paroled in 2004, with one condition specifically banning them from seeing each other. Number 6. Naomi Fur. In the early morning hours of October the 30th of 2022, an on-duty officer from the Sarasota Police Department in Florida approached the red traffic lights at the intersection of North Cranberry Boulevard and North Toledo Blade Boulevard. As noted in an official report, the policeman noticed a black sedan stopped almost completely in the intersection. Upon running the vehicle's tags, the officer discovered that its plates were expired and the registered owner, a Hooters waitress named Naomi Furrer, had a suspended driver's license. A traffic stop was subsequently initiated, at which point the officer positively identified the individual behind the wheel as Furrer, who was the only occupant of the vehicle. During their interaction, which was captured on body cam footage, widely shared in the aftermath, the woman was observed to have bloodshot, watery eyes and slightly slurred speech. She seemed to have trouble recounting her recent whereabouts and activities, but appeared to be dressed in a costume for Halloween and later confirmed to have been coming from a Halloween party. The officer also noted that Furrer had a wristband consistent with those given out at local bars. When asked to exit her vehicle, Furrer complied before agreeing to perform field sobriety tests. Given her poor performance on the tests administered, as well as her license's suspended status, the officer subsequently felt there was enough evidence to arrest the woman. As she was being handcuffed and placed in the back of the squad car, Furrer protested and even offered to remove all her clothes in exchange for being released. She was taken to the Sarasota County Jail without incident and, as of February of 2023, the criminal proceedings were still ongoing. Number 5. Anthony McRae In the aftermath of the deadly mass shooting at Michigan State University in February of 2023, body camera footage of the suspected shooter's arrest from years earlier emerged online. Back in June of 2019, a Langson police officer entered a parking lot on the 2600 block of Northeast Street, where Anthony McRae was found sitting on the steps outside a building. When the policeman inquired about whether that was McRae's place of work, he said that it wasn't, then stood up with what appeared to be a cell phone and cigarette in his right hand. Upon being asked if he had a weapon on him, the man confirmed that he did, a handgun in his left front coat pocket. McRae was consequently arrested on a felony charge of carrying a concealed weapon without a permit. His attorney initially argued that the charge should be dropped, since his arrest was precipitated by what they deemed to be an unlawful stop and frisk. Prosecutors contended that the officer had acted appropriately during his interaction with McRae. The latter ultimately pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor gun charge and was given probation as punishment. McRae's freedom allowed him to enter Berkey Hall on Michigan State University's campus and open fire on the evening of February the 13th of 2023. During the course of the onslaught, which spanned multiple campus locations, three students were slain and five others were wounded. Shortly before midnight, McRae died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound after he was confronted by the police. Number 4. Polo G Footage of prominent American rapper Polo G's 2021 arrest in Miami, Florida, surfaced online the following summer. Court records indicated that the artist behind the chart-topping single, Rap Star, had been taken into police custody on charges that included battery against a police officer and resisting arrest. In the video, Polo G, born Taurus Tremani Bartlett, was shown berating the arresting officers and repeatedly highlighting the fact that he has more money than they do. After Bartlett criticized the officer's career choice even further, the video transitioned to a later point in time when the suspect was sitting in the police station while handcuffed. He proceeded to state his case, 
claiming that he'd passed out because he was kept in the back of a patrol car for several hours in the South Florida heat with the windows rolled up. Police officials refuted Bartlett's claims that he was mistreated, instead focusing on the rapper's alleged insubordination and repeated resistance when they were attempting to detain him. The entire incident reportedly stemmed from a contentious traffic stop that took place following a release party for his studio album entitled Hall of Fame. A car Bartlett and his teen brother were riding in was pulled over for having tinted windows. The passengers were accused of neglecting to roll down the window when subsequently approached by officers, and Bartlett was apparently the only one who refused to exit the vehicle when asked to do so. His legal team alleged that he and his brother were immediately targeted and antagonized by the officers at the scene, while the authorities claimed that it was the rapper who inflamed tensions and refused to cooperate. Bartlett later had three of his five charges dropped, including two felony counts. His remaining charges would likewise be dismissed if he completed an anger management program. Number 3. Ryan Vest Ohio man Ryan Vest was accused of fatally shooting a woman in Batavia Township on January the 17th of 2023. The following day, local law enforcement caught up with him near Eastgate Mall in Claremont County. Officers had reportedly pulled over a grey jeep at about 2.30 p.m. 30-year-old Vest was sitting in the passenger seat at the time of the traffic stop and was immediately identified by police. As shown in a video recorded by a bystander who was pumping gas, Vest was ordered out of the vehicle with his hands up. The man complied with the officer's instructions and walked backwards towards them with his hands above his head. He then got on his knees and was placed in handcuffs without incident. According to subsequent reports, Vest was wanted in connection to the killing of 39-year-old Casey Moss, who'd been gunned down in what was described as a drug deal gone bad. Following his arrest, Vest faced charges of aggravated murder and attempted aggravated murder, as well as tampering with evidence. Number 2. Jesse Jane Texas-born adult film star Jesse Jane was involved in a domestic dispute with her boyfriend in late January of 2020. According to official reports, the 39-year-old, whose real name is Cindy Taylor, had been drinking when she suddenly got into a heated argument with her unnamed partner, which turned physical. Police responded to the couple's home in Moore, Oklahoma, where Taylor's boyfriend said that he'd woken up to find her throwing out his medication, which she claimed to be steroids. When he confronted her, she allegedly attacked him in a rage. The man presented with a bloody wound near his left eye and reportedly had visible bite marks on his left hand. Taylor, meanwhile, offered a different version of events. She claimed that her boyfriend had actually picked her up by the neck and thrown her against the wall, but first responders didn't observe any injuries on her body to support the allegation. The adult film actress ultimately faced a count of domestic violence in connection to the incident, which wasn't the first time she'd been criminally charged. Back in November of 2018, police officers found Taylor passed out drunk and soaked in her own urine on a sidewalk in Norman. The body cam footage of her subsequent arrest garnered a lot of attention online. She was charged with public intoxication, though later claimed to have been drugged after drinking only two alcoholic beverages while watching a college football game. Number 1. James Hybe In the late summer of 2022, a local media outlet based out of Portland, Oregon, obtained body cam footage of the high-profile arrest of State Representative James Hybe on the 17th of August. Police officers were called to the Clackamas County Fair and Rodeo in Canby, where a woman had reportedly asked Hybe to put out his cigarette. The request angered the public official, who escalated the situation by aggressively confronting the woman. When law enforcement caught up with him later, he was slurring his words and immediately became combative. In the video, Hybe was shown wearing a white campaign shirt. He claimed that while smoking was prohibited on the fairgrounds, he was never asked to leave the property. When asked for his identification, Hybe refused and continued to debate with law enforcement as to whether he was in the wrong. The man challenged the Clackamas County deputies to arrest him, which they did, prompting him to fall to the ground and spout profanities at them. Hybe, who'd been appointed to represent Oregon House District 39 only a few months earlier, was taken to the Clackamas County Jail on charges of disorderly conduct 
criminal trespass and interfering with a peace officer. Although he did spend the night behind bars, the politician was subsequently released and the district attorney declined to prosecute him on any criminal charges, citing a lack of sufficient evidence. Number 13. Joshua James 24-year-old Joshua James from the town of Jupiter pleaded guilty to misdemeanor assault and unlawful possession of an alligator on May the 31st of 2016 after throwing the animal into a Wendy's drive through window. James apologized for the stunt, saying that at the time, he believed it would be an amusing joke. The cashier on duty that day testified in court telling the judge she'd escaped the restaurant through the window in a wild panic. She also revealed the incident had caused her to consider quitting. James was ultimately sentenced to 75 hours of community service and would remain on parole for a year. The judge also ordered him to pay a $1,200 fine, undergo a mental health evaluation, as well as to stay away from any Wendy's franchise and animals other than his family's dog. Wow, I'm really in trouble for this. Uh, I think my uh, pranking days are over. Number 12. Matthew Leatham 22-year-old Matthew Leatham was arrested in Pasco County in January of 2021 for fraudulently using the 911 system and possession of an illicit substance. Leatham, who sported a tattoo of the state of Florida in the middle of his forehead, called the emergency line four times, screaming at the dispatcher that he needed a ride home. During one of the calls, he even hung up, claiming to have dialed the wrong number. The deputy that showed up at the scene offered to call him a taxi, but Leatham refused stating he didn't have any money. He was arrested, then released three days later. The following year, Leatham once again got into trouble with the law when he attacked his friend with a razor blade, slashing his neck. The unidentified victim's wound needed to be stapled, sh needed to be stapled shut, and he was treated at the hospital for several other injuries as well. Even though Leatham claimed he'd been acted in self-defense, he was charged with aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. Number 11. James Muchaccio On December the 26th of 2018, James Muchaccio drove his Ferrari into the Intracoastal Waterway in Palm Beach. He initially parked his car on the dock, but police officers then approached him to tell him he would have to move it. Instead of driving away, Muchaccio accelerated sharply and consequently landed directly into the water. The entire incident was caught by a dash camera when questioned by police. The man claimed to have driven into the waterway because Jesus told him to do it. He managed to make his way out of the Ferrari before it sank, at which point he was taken back to shore by two fishermen. Throughout his conversation with law enforcement, Muchachio kept ranting, adding that money would become irrelevant in two days' time. Number 10. Carlos Rodriguez 31-year-old Carlos Rodriguez, a Florida man with a notably deformed skull, was arrested for arson and attempted murder on October the 17th of 2016. Firefighters and state troopers arrived at Rodriguez's duplex after a concerned witness called 911 regarding a fire. After the blaze was handled, investigators discovered that Rodriguez had intentionally poured igniting fuel on his mattress in order to start the fire. Detectives considered the man's actions, at least in part, as an attempt against his neighbor's lives. It was the second time Rodriguez made headlines in the state of Florida Back in 2012, he reportedly crashed his car into a telephone pole, severely injuring his head. He underwent life-saving surgery, but doctors needed to remove a portion of his skull and brain in order to stabilize him, leading to the distinct shape of his head. Number 9. Brandy Lerma 31-year-old Brandy Lerma, a resident of West Palm Beach, was arrested for driving erratically with an unrestrained minor in the back seat on August the 12th of 2017. Police were alerted to the reckless driver by a concerned witness. Officers promptly pulled Lerma over, at which point they noticed that she seemed intoxicated and looked disheveled and dirty. She openly admitted to drinking as well as taking prescription drugs before getting behind the wheel. A small child was reportedly sitting in the back without a seat belt. Lerma was thus arrested and charged with child neglect and DUI. Number 8. Gardenia McCulloch Gardenia McCulloch, 
A 23-year-old Florida resident was arrested on March the 7th of 2019 for stealing an SUV from an Ace renter car. She was taken into police custody at a hotel only a mile away from the business's parking lot. When police arrived at the scene, she attempted to hide in one of the rooms but was eventually arrested. She reportedly kept insisting she'd only wanted to rent a vehicle, but when she was told they were overbooked, demons commanded her to steal one. McCulloch underwent a psychiatric evaluation at the request of the court and was found incompetent to stand trial. Number 7. Tessa B. Lilly On November the 7th of 2019, Tessa B. Lilly was arrested for bringing illicit substances into the Kim C. Hammond Justice Center in Flagler County. When the 25-year-old woman tried to walk through the metal detector, Deputy Vince Schrider noticed she was carrying a suspicious bag in her pocket. Lily told Schrider it was makeup, but when the substance, which weighed 1.44 grams, was tested, it was positively identified as an illegal stimulant. She was arrested at the scene and held on a $30,000 bond. Number 6. Lisa Ann Sloan Lisa Ann Sloan, aged 56, was arrested on July the 19th of 2022 after she tried to sell teddy bears while armed with a pitchfork and whip outside a Publix grocery store in Clermont. Authorities were alerted to a woman waving a pitchfork around and brandishing a whip menacingly. Sloan also reportedly damaged a parked minivan. When policemen approached her, she pointed the whip at them and refused to leave. As she was subsequently being arrested, Sloan began screaming, God is great, repeatedly, and warned the officers she felt no pain because God was in control. Law enforcement noted a woman was heavily intoxicated at the time. Sloan was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon in the aftermath of her public outburst. Number 5. Brian Keith Harrington on February the 4th of 2019, Brian Keith Harrington went on a rampage, triggered by his sister's boyfriend moving his cigars. The 23-year-old man became violent after he couldn't find his box of cigars and began screaming at his pregnant sister, as well as others, at the Pinellas Park residence. He grabbed everything he could get a hold of, including a ketchup container, juice bottle, and other food packages, which he then started throwing at his sister. When police were called to the scene, Harrington shifted his anger towards the responding officer, threatening to kill him and even attempting to bite his thumb. He was arrested and charged with battery, threatening and resisting arrest. He was released after posting his $10,150 bail. Number 4. Benjamin Austin Page On May the 17th of 2020, Benjamin Austin Page was charged with second-degree murder after gunning down his partner in Lehigh Acres. According to Sheriff Carmine Marcino, 22-year-old Page and the victim, Terence Brown, had been in a violent argument after the latter said he wouldn't delete explicit pictures that featured the two of them. During the course of the verbal altercation, Page pulled out a gun and fired it several times in Brown's direction. The victim was ultimately declared dead at the scene by responding emergency crews. Following his arrest, Page was held in jail on a $2 million bond. The young man had reportedly been released from prison earlier that year in connection with an unrelated offense, so accounts of possession of a firearm by a convicted felon was added to his list of charges. On April 30th of 2022, he was found guilty and sentenced to 35 years behind bars. Number 3. Katie Jade Gates 19-year-old Katie Jade Gates got into trouble with the law on September the 12th of 2019 when she threatened her grandfather with a knife for refusing to give her tomatoes while they were having dinner at their Callahan residence. When police arrived at the home, Gates admitted throwing items at her grandparents but denied making any threats and stated she'd only been holding the knife because she was eating. Eyewitness testimony contradicted her statements, however. Other members of the family told police the young woman had begun shouting and behaving disrespectfully towards her grandparents, mother, and another adult present at the scene, identified as Jose Luis Valdez Monteo. After Gates lost her temper, she threw a water bottle and a pack of cigarettes at her relatives before eventually grabbing a knife. 
According to the family, the teen began chasing her grandfather around the house, screaming about how she was going to stab him in the face. Gates was arrested and charged with aggravated battery on a person over the age of 65, an aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. She was ordered to stay at least 500 feet away from her grandfather as well as her mother. Two weeks prior to the assault, Gates had been arrested for a traffic violation, for which she was issued a small fine. Number 2. Michael Gould On November 28, 2018, Michael Gould was admitted to the hospital in Ocala with gunshot wounds claiming to have been shot by a robber. Police were able to determine the wounds had been self-inflicted after discovering shell casings in his car and also learned that he was in possession of a firearm that matched his injuries. Since he'd been convicted of five prior felonies, 37-year-old Gould wasn't legally permitted to own the weapon. When he was interviewed a second time, the man admitted to accidentally shooting himself when he was drunk. He was sentenced to 30 months in prison. Number 1. Jacob Alexander Zane Heisel When 26-year-old Jacob Alexander Zane Heisel, who had a warrant out for his arrest, was stopped by the police one day, he decided to give the officers his brother's name, only to discover that he was wanted by the authorities as well. The incident occurred on July the 21st of 2019, while Heisel was walking down US 41 in Bradenton. The young man initially told law enforcement he wasn't carrying his ID before giving the troopers his 23-year-old brother's name, Nathan, believing it would get him out of trouble. Heisel was then taken into custody on his sibling's warrant, but when police fingerprinted him, they discovered his true identity. Additional charges of false identification to law enforcement were added to his existing list of offenses, which already included dealing stolen property and possession of a forged instrument. Number 10. Sierra Alexis Sutton On August the 16th of 2017, 30-year-old Sierra Alexis Sutton shot her living boyfriend in the head and dismembered his body with a machete in Baytown, Texas. According to local police, Sutton stopped answering phone calls and wasn't available for interviews after she reported 32-year-old Stephen Coleman as a missing person on August the 18th, two days after the killing. A neighbor described the suspect as having acted like she knew nothing about the man's disappearance. Four days after her report, Coleman's torso was discovered at a Baytown landfill. Investigators ultimately determined that he'd been fatally shot in the head by his lover while he was asleep. After they'd gotten into an argument, the woman cut him up into pieces, wrapped his body parts in a sheet, and disposed of them in several dumpsters around the city. She fled from Baytown to Materi, Louisiana, but was later found and arrested. According to detectives, she openly told multiple people about the shooting and said she dismembered his corpse because he was too heavy to carry. In her official confession, she added that her 10-year-old daughter was in the living room at the time of the murder. In February of 2019, she was convicted and consequently sentenced to 45 years behind bars. Number 9. Texas woman. A traffic stop conducted by a sheriff's deputy in the east of La Praia, Texas, culminated in the arrest of a woman driving a silver vehicle on February the 25th of 2023, when the deputy instructed the woman to pop the trunk, an adult female and child were discovered inside. The driver, who hadn't been identified as of the most recent updates, was charged with smuggling of persons with a likelihood of serious bodily injury and smuggling of persons under 18 years of age. Her car was impounded, and the woman and child who hid inside the compartment were turned over to Border Patrol agents. Number 8. Stanton Pierce, Laurie Perry, and Rebecca Bond. The body of Tyler man Luis Martinez was found in a cemetery in Smith County, Texas, in September of 2016. Stanton Pierce, Laurie Perry, and Rebecca Bond were accused of killing the 62-year-old after they burned his body near the Antioch Cemetery. The motive for the killing was unfortunately unknown. Perry told authorities that she'd witnessed Martinez being shot by Bond at a Little Field Drive residence. As detailed in the arrest affidavit, she said that a 22 caliber rifle was used and added that she wore gloves to break down the rifle while 52-year-old Pearson Bond transferred the body to an undisclosed location. The two women, 56-year-old Perry and Bond, aged 37, were immediately arrested. Pierce was caught September the 22nd of 2016 
following a car chase in which his truck slammed into a tree. The man pleaded guilty to tampering with or fabricating physical evidence with intent to impair a human corpse in February of 2017 and was given a 40-year prison sentence. On April the 6th of 2017, Perry accepted a plea deal and was sentenced to 15 years in custody on a charge identical to Pierce's. Bond, meanwhile, also accepted a plea deal and was sentenced to 50 years in prison for a murder conviction. Number 7. Troy LaRue Parker A missing 19-year-old girl's body was found inside the trunk of her car in Missouri City, Texas on August the 27th of 2018. When Sabrina Herrera's family weren't able to reach her that day, they quickly grew worried and eventually tried to locate her using an app. They alerted investigators after they tracked her phone to the 1600 block of Bent Oak Drive. When the police arrived in the area, they located the woman's vehicle and found her body in the trunk. Upon further investigation, it was determined that her high school sweetheart was the last person who'd seen her before she went missing. The boyfriend, 20-year-old Troy LaRue Parker, was subsequently taken into custody, after which he admitted to strangling Herrera using a cord at his home in the 8400 block of Quail Run Drive in Houston. He then added that he placed her body in the trunk of her car, drove to Missouri City, and left the vehicle in a Fort Bend neighborhood. He never disclosed the motive for killing his girlfriend of five years, but was charged with murder. He pleaded guilty, was fined $10,000, and on October the 3rd of 2019, received a sentence of 45 years in prison. Number 6. Christopher Johnson on the night of July the 25th of 2015, Christopher Johnson was arrested for driving under the influence in Harris County, Texas. After being taken to jail, he was reportedly choked by two Harris County employees after he smiled while his mugshot was being taken. He was reportedly told by one of the officers that he should take the picture right, meaning without such a jovial expression. The suspect replied by saying that he always smiled when pictures of him were taken. While another shot was being snapped, he was allegedly choked by another officer who was wearing gloves. A year later, Johnson sued Harris County for the alleged assault, which included choking, berating, and ridiculing him while he posed for a total of 10 photographs. Number 5. Sean Carl Payne On the night of October the 4th of 2012, 35-year-old Sean Carl Payne was accused of public intoxication outside of Shamrock's Bar in Humble, in the Houston metropolitan area of Texas. Police were phoned about his inebriated behavior by employees at the Irish Bar. According to law enforcement sources, the establishment's patrons said that the man had enjoyed beers and several shots. When Payne was taken to jail, an officer had to physically hold his head up in order for a mugshot to be taken. Number four. Marissa Ann Sluss and Hannah Marie Webb. At around 3 a.m. on May the 4th of 2017, Texas woman Marissa Ann Sluss called the cops on herself for being too inebriated to drive. Sluss and her friend, 20-year-old Hannah Marie Webb, were parked in the middle of the street on the 100 block of West Parkwood Avenue in Friendswood when officers arrived at the scene. According to law enforcement, the 25-year-old motorist was on her phone and smelled distinctly of alcohol. She told the police that she'd dialed 911 because Webb wasn't complying. The two failed a sobriety test they were administered and were consequently arrested. Webb was charged with public intoxication while Sluss was charged with driving while intoxicated. Number 3. Wanda the Pom Pom Mum Holloway On January the 30th of 1991, a neighborhood in Channel View, Texas, discovered that a local mother tried to secure her 13-year-old daughter's spot on the cheerleading squad by plotting to eliminate the competition. 37-year-old Wanda Holloway was reportedly willing to kill for her daughter Shanna's cheerleading endeavors. The latter didn't initially have a spot on the team because another hopeful, Amber Heath, was chosen over her. Holloway subsequently asked her former brother-in-law, Terry Harper, to help her arrange the killing of Amber's mother, Verna Heath. She believed that if Verna was dead, her daughter would be too devastated to perform, which would then result in Shanna getting the spot. When Holloway met with Harper to finalize the hit, the latter covertly recorded their conversation, after which he reported her to the authorities. The audio tapes revealed that the woman agreed to pay $5,000 for the killing of 
both mother and daughter and $2,500 if only the mother was killed. Holloway was arrested and charged with solicitation of capital murder. On September the 3rd of 1991, she was found guilty and was given a recommendation for a 15-year prison sentence. Additionally, she was fined $10,000. Five years later, her sentence was reduced to 10 years after the defense petitioned for a new trial. On March the 1st of 1997, after she'd served six years, she was ordered to serve the remaining nine and a half years on probation. Dubbed the Pom Pom Mum, Holloway was also required to serve a thousand hours of community service. Number two, Terry Missy Bevers. At around 5 a.m. on April the 18th of 2016, Terry Missy Bevers was getting ready for a fitness class when she was found unresponsive by her students at Midlothian's Creekside Church. The 45-year-old fitness instructor from Red Oak, Texas, had multiple puncture wounds to the chest as well as a head injury. When paramedics arrived, she was officially pronounced dead and law enforcement commenced an investigation into her death. Camera footage from the church showed an individual who walked with a limp wearing a SWAT uniform and tactical gear at around 3.50 a.m. The unidentified suspect broke open a door with a hammer to gain access. The victim was first seen in a church at around 4.20 a.m. Several law enforcement agencies were still working on the unsolved case as of the latest developments. In 2021, a reward of $150,000 was offered in exchange for information that could lead to the suspect's identification and capture. Number one. Valerie McDaniel and Leon Jacob. Texas couple Valerie McDaniel and Leon Jacob were arrested on March the 10th of 2017 after being accused of hiring a hitman to take care of both their exes. 48-year-old Valerie and Jacob, aged 39, met with the prospective hitman at an Olive Garden restaurant in Houston. They offered $20,000 and two Cartier watches in exchange for the lives of their respective ex-lovers. Unbeknownst to them, the assassin was an undercover cop, later identified only as Detective Javier. According to investigators, Jacob was out on bond after being charged with assault and accused of stalking his ex-girlfriend, 32-year-old Megan Veracas. He told Javier that he wanted Veracas dead so that she couldn't testify against him in court. Valerie then allegedly requested that her ex-husband, Marion McDaniel III, be murdered under the guise of a carjacking gone wrong. The undercover officer coordinated with other law enforcement officials and made sure the intended targets were safe. After Marion and Veracas were tipped off to their former partner's scheme, the two cooperated with authorities to secure their arrest. McDaniel faked his own death with photos of him slumped to the car with a bullet wound on his head. Veracas was asked to do something similar, tied up to a chair with duct tape over her mouth. She was photographed as though she'd been kidnapped. Javier took the pictures to the couple as proof that the exes had been dealt with. Later on, officers showed up at Valerie's flat at the River Oaks high-rise apartment building where they informed the couple that McDaniel had been found dead. The officers' body cameras captured the pair's feigned shock over the news. Even before the officers started asking them any questions, Valerie had already provided an alibi. They were both subsequently arrested and charged with solicitation of capital murder. Jacob remained in custody without bond, while Valerie posted a $50,000 bond on March the 25th of 2017. She then recorded her last words on her iPad in which she said that she never wanted to hurt anyone. Two days later, she jumped off the seventh floor of the apartment building in the 2200 block of Willow Wick Road. A year later, Jacob was convicted of plotting the double murder and sentenced to life in prison. The judge decreed that he would become eligible for parole after serving at least 30 years. Number 10. Brian Altimirano Solano Local authorities received a call regarding an unresponsive male inside a room in Caesars Palace on May the 15th of 2023. 25-year-old Brian Altimirano Solano from Nicaragua was found unresponsive by a member of the hotel's housekeeping staff. When Las Vegas Metropolitan Police officers arrived at the location on South Las Vegas Boulevard, they determined that the man had suffered an apparent gunshot wound to the chest. Shortly after, responding medical personnel pronounced him dead at the scene. Inculpatory evidence helped authorities identify Erica Covington and Ariona Taylor, both 20 as the suspects. 
Surveillance footage revealed that prior to the incident, the two women and Altamirano Solana were walking hand in hand and laughing while heading towards his room shortly after 2.30 a.m. Approximately 14 minutes later, Covington and Taylor can be seen running back down the same hallway carrying a bag that allegedly belonged to the victim. They reportedly got into a stolen white car and left the area. After further investigation, authorities also found an Instagram post by Covington that further implicated her and Taylor's involvement in the shooting. In the post, both could be seen in Caesars on the night in question wearing the same clothes that could be seen in the surveillance footage. Both suspects were arrested on May the 17th at an apartment where investigators also found the clothing shown in the video, as well as a Glock magazine. According to the police report, the bullet that took Altamirano Solano's life matched the cartridge casing from another domestic violence case that Taylor had been involved in. In June, Covington and Taylor were indicted on murder and burglary charges. As of the latest updates, both women pleaded not guilty to the charges and were held in custody at the Clark County Detention Center. Number 9. Svezdana Benkun 37-year-old Nevada man Slobodan Milos admitted to Las Vegas authorities that he'd used an aluminium bat to kill his wife Svezdana Benkun, aged 31. The gruesome incident unfolded at the couple's apartment located at the 9500 block of West Sahara Avenue on the morning of May the 17th of 2019. According to an arrest report, Milos went to a store where he bought the bat and other items on the day in question. On his drive back home, he reportedly sipped on a mixed drink. While Benkin was sleeping in the bed of their home, Milus entered the room and bludgeoned her with the bat. When their teenage son arrived at around 4.30 p.m., he found Benkin unconscious and dialed 911. Responding officers found Milus laying on the bed next to his dying wife and immediately arrested him. The victim was then taken to the University Medical Center where she was pronounced dead. Milas told detectives that he'd reached a boiling point because of their rocky marriage, wherein he felt Benkus had been cheating. He was held without bond at the Clark County Detention Center on a murder charge. Records indicate that Milas was scheduled for a jury trial on September the 11th of 2023. Number 8. Caleb Rogers a Las Vegas Metropolitan Police officer was accused of perpetrating three casino heists between November of 2021 and February of 2022, stealing nearly $165,000. Prosecutors alleged that 35-year-old Caleb Rogers was a gambling addict who targeted casinos off the Las Vegas Strip due to desperation over unpaid debts. Rogers, who'd been in the police force for seven years, was an active duty patrol officer at the time of the heists. Rogers was only quarter after the third heist, which transpired at the Rio All Suite Hotel and Casino on February the 27th of 2022. He entered the establishment apparently wearing a disguise and carrying a loaded police-issued revolver. He then stormed the sportsbook, shoving a 63-year-old cashier out of his way and threatening to use a gun. After making off with at least $79,000, Rogers was eventually detained by security and later turned over to authorities. According to a Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department spokesperson, the man was suspended without pay pending the outcome of his case. In July of 2023, Rogers' brother testified against him in exchange for immunity from prosecution. The brother noted how they had plotted and carried out the first heist together. The federal jury convicted Rogers on account of brandishing a firearm during a crime of violence and three counts of interference with commerce by robbery. Rogers is awaiting his sentencing, but is facing life in prison because he brandished the gun during the third heist. Number 7. Mallory Angel Armillo At approximately 12.16 on June the 23rd of 2023, a Nevada woman was allegedly gunned down at a 7-Eleven near Las Vegas Boulevard over a stolen salad. Law enforcement responded to the business in the 500 block of East Sahara Avenue and found Mallory Angel Armillo, who was suffering from two gunshot wounds to the back. Emergency medical services then arrived and transported the 35-year-old to Sunrise Hospital, where she succumbed to her wounds. Homicide detectives determined that an altercation had ensued between the victim and a 35-year-old store clerk named Ranier Jefferson over the stolen salad. 
During the course of the argument, Armio and Jefferson struggled. CCTV footage revealed that after Jefferson had retrieved the salad, he then grabbed a handgun before opening fire at Armio. The gun was later recovered on the roof of the 7-Eleven. Five days later, Jefferson was arrested on charges of murder, violation of probation, and possession of a gun by a prohibited person. He was booked into the Clark County Detention Center without bond. Number 6. Tabitha Totsi In the wake of an argument, a Las Vegas woman was purportedly shot in the head by her boyfriend. The cold-blooded ordeal took place at a residence in the 8100 block of Lagarde Drive shortly before 11 a.m. on April the 22nd of 2023. When local police arrived, they found the wounded woman identified as 26-year-old Tabitha Totsi. The boyfriend, however, had already absconded with Totsi's vehicle, according to a witness. Totsi was taken to a medical center where she died two days later. The Clark County Coroner's Office subsequently ruled her death a homicide. After being named as the suspect in the killing, a state warrant was issued for Totsi's 26-year-old boyfriend, Oswaldo Natanahel Perez Sanchez. Perez Sanchez remains at large as of the making of this video and reports indicate that he is considered armed and dangerous. He is facing multiple charges, including murder, coercion constituting domestic violence, robbery, and grand larceny of a motor vehicle. On June the 21st, the FBI's Las Vegas field office offered a reward of up to $10,000 for information that could lead to his arrest. Number 5. Kenneth Cherry Jr. A Las Vegas shooting that occurred on February the 23rd of 2013 claimed the lives of several people, including Kenneth Cherry Jr. The 27-year-old rapper, who went by the name Kenny Clutch, had a heated confrontation with a man in the valet area of a local hotel. According to the police, Cherry and the man drove northbound on Las Vegas Boulevard in their respective vehicles. The latter, who was driving a Range Rover, fired several rounds into the former's Maserati, which consequently careened out of control. The Maserati slammed into several cars, one of which burst into flames, killing two of its occupants in the aftermath. Upon the deaths of three people, including Cherry, a manhunt was launched by authorities. 26-year-old Amar Harris, who was a convicted felon in South Carolina, and 22-year-old Tanisha LaShawn Howard were identified as persons of interest. Harris was the alleged shooter, while Howard was in the Range Rover during the incident. Police found Howard on February the 27th, but she was cleared of any involvement. Harris was later convicted of 11 felony charges, which included three counts of first-degree murder. He was formally sentenced to death on January the 4th of 2016 and locked up at Eli State Prison. Number 4. Jarrell Ng Law enforcement were called to an apartment on the 9000 block of West Katy Avenue in Las Vegas, Nevada at around 11 p.m. on March the 22nd of 2021. 37-year-old Emily Ikuta told a police dispatcher that she found her husband face down on the floor after returning to their Spring Valley home from walking their dog. Ikuta told investigators that 36-year-old Jarrell Ng might have accidentally shot himself while cleaning a gun. She claimed that she had found his firearm on the floor near Ng and then locked it in a closet. According to detectives, Ikuta's version of events was inconsistent with the evidence at the scene. Acquaintances of the victim told detectives that Ung was on a live chat with them when they heard a slapping noise they believed was a gunshot. Neighbors also heard the couple arguing at the time of the incident. Ikuta was then held without bond on March the 25th for open murder after the police department's homicide section ruled out the possibility that the gun had accidentally gone off in Ung's hands. 14 months later, she pleaded guilty to second-degree murder by way of an Alford plea. This meant that the defendant maintained her innocence, but admitted the prosecution's evidence would probably result in a guilty verdict. On August the 3rd of 2022, she was ordered to serve 10 to 25 years in the Nevada Department of Corrections as part of the agreement. Number 3. Judith Ann DeAndrade 37-year-old Judith Ann DeAndrade from Las Vegas, Nevada, was caught carrying $800,000 worth of methamphetamine by authorities in Nebraska. Officers stopped a Toyota Camry on Interstate 80 shortly after 2.30 p.m. on March the 9th of 2022. 
After a probable cause was developed to search the vehicle, officers found 18 and a half pounds of methamphetamine, 40 grams of fentanyl, used syringes, and $2,620 in cash. According to the Lancaster Sheriff's Office, DeAndre and another woman in the vehicle named Arika Marie Downs, aged 35, were then taken into custody. They were both booked into jail for charges of possession of methamphetamine with intent to deliver, possession of money while in possession of controlled substances, and evading taxes. A month after her arrest, DeAndre was found dead in her cell due to what were later determined to have been bacteria in her heart. As of the latest updates, Downs pleaded guilty on March the 28th of 2023 and was awaiting sentencing. Number 2. Lakeisha N. Holloway In the winter of 2015, dozens of people were mowed down at the Las Vegas Strip by a vehicle driven by 24-year-old Oregon woman Lakeisha N. Holloway. The woman was homeless and out of money, living in her 1996 Oldsmobile sedan with her toddler. According to authorities, in the middle of December, she arrived in Las Vegas from Portland with her daughter, parking and spending the night throughout the city. Holloway was allegedly stressed about finding a place to sleep after being chased away by security from parking lots where she'd been trying to sleep. She claimed to have snapped on the night of December the 20th of 2015 while looking for yet another place to sleep. She veered her vehicle right onto the sidewalk and then back onto the road before going back onto the sidewalk outside of Planet Hollywood. Her daughter, who was inside the vehicle, wasn't harmed. However, at least 37 pedestrians were injured and one woman, 32-year-old Jessica Valenzuela, was killed instantly. Holloway drove away from the carnage and parked at a casino a few blocks away. She asked the valet to call 911 after explaining what she'd done. She was then taken into custody without bail. According to the Clark County Sheriff, there was no evidence that Holloway had alcohol in her system, but a drug recognition expert at the scene determined that she'd been under the influence of some kind of stimulant. Reports indicated that she'd been in state psychiatric care for several years after the incident. Due to her mental health condition, her scheduled trial in 2019 was delayed twice. In May of 2023, she rejected a plea bargain. She was scheduled to stand trial in 2024 on murder and 70 other felony charges, including child neglect, attempted murder, and battery with the use of a deadly weapon. That was almost it for our latest compilation, but Stay tuned after the final listing if you missed our first compilation about when the USA goes wrong. Number 1. Esmeralda Gonzalez On May the 31st of 2019, an Instagram model living in Las Vegas was reported missing. Surveillance footage in the 9000 block of West Torino Avenue revealed 24-year-old Esmeralda Gonzalez was last seen in the area wandering in a state of confusion during the early hours of the day in question. Meaningful developments came about 48 days later when a tipster only identified as Trisha linked 45-year-old Christopher Prestopino and 39-year-old Cassandra Garrett to Gonzalez's disappearance. According to the witness, Gonzalez ended up at Prestopino's Southwest Valley home during which Gonzalez was given methamphetamine. Prestopino, together with Garrett, held the woman against her will by tying her up to a bedpost for an extended period, allegedly beating the victim. Garrett then injected her with a syringe of muriatic acid which ultimately took her life. The witness also informed investigators that her remains were dumped in the desert. Finally, after five months on October the 8th, detectives found a body inside a 250-gallon water tank that had been filled with concrete and covered with wood. North of Las Vegas, a Rolex watch and Chanel necklace, which were confirmed to have been owned by Gonzalez, was still on the body. After authorities executed extensive forensic work, the body was confirmed to be that of Gonzalez. Three days later, Prestopino, along with his 31-year-old girlfriend, Lisa Mort, were arrested. The former was charged with open murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and kidnapping. Mort, on the other hand, was accused of aiding a felon, as she'd previously tried to warn Prestopino about the homicide investigation into Gonzalez's death on October the 18th. 
Garrett was apprehended in Wisconsin and extradited to Las Vegas. She was indicted on the same charges as Prestepino. Mort pleaded guilty to accessory to murder in February of 2020 and was handed a two to five year sentence behind bars. Prestepino pleaded guilty to second degree murder and first degree kidnapping via an Alford plea in March of 2023. He was ordered to serve 10 to 25 years in prison. Garrett, who pleaded guilty to a charge of voluntary manslaughter with a deadly weapon, was sentenced on May the 23rd of 2023 to a minimum of eight years of incarceration with a maximum of 20 years. Number six, Jaroslav Hanel. In January of 2020, officers and firefighters arrived at a home at the far end of the famed Waikiki Beach to a crime scene that grew progressively more chaotic. 69-year-old Yaroslav Hanel, originally from the Czech Republic, reacted with extreme violence upon learning that plans to evict him were finally set in motion. For years, Hanel had been living for free at a property owned by 77-year-old Lois Kane in an upscale neighborhood on Hibiscus Road in exchange for his work as a handyman. Neighbors described him as paranoid and unhinged. He would allegedly harass visitors, chase cars down the street, rig barbecues to blow thick smoke into their windows and film them with a GoPro mounted on his hat. He repeatedly refused to leave the property, even though several neighbors had had restraining orders against him since 2014. It's believed that Hanel sought revenge after his eviction notice was handed down. His rampage began on January the 19th with the killing of Kane, Gisela King, a tenant in the same home went to find the landlady. Hanel was in the laundry room but wouldn't let King inside. She then heard a sound which she'd later identify as Kane gasping for air. King tried to call the police but Hanel charged her and started stabbing her with a gardening tool. He kept attacking the woman as she curled into a ball and pleaded for her life. Neighbors managed to chase him away, pulled King up the driveway and improvised a tourniquet for her severely wounded leg. As police arrived at the address and walked towards the entrance, Hanel opened fire on them with an AR-15 rifle. Officers Tiffany Enriquez, aged 38, and 34-year-old Kulaike Kalama sustained fatal gunshot injuries. Both had reportedly been wearing bulletproof vests but were struck above them. Hanel then set the home ablaze and more gunshot sounds were heard, attributed to Hanel's spear ammunition that caught fire inside. Firefighters were initially asked to keep their distance so that they wouldn't be struck by stray rounds. The fire extended and gutted at least seven homes while damaging several others. The remains of Hanel and Kane were recovered from the ashes and positively identified. Honolulu Police Chief Susan Ballard held back tears as she announced the death of the two officers whom she said were like her kids, while King mourned the passing of Kane, whom she regarded as a mother figure. Number 5. Lindani Maeni A former rugby player and idols contestant from South Africa was fatally shot by Honolulu police officers in April of 2021 following an alleged burglary. A 911 call provided some insight into the incident that ended in the death of Lindani Maeni, reported as a prince from the Zulu Kingdom. He entered an Airbnb rented by Shaheen Sabine Wang and her husband. The woman called the police claiming that an intruder was inside. As confirmed by the caller, Maini had already left the home when officers arrived at the scene. It was after 8 p.m. and in the dark, a physical struggle ensued between 29-year-old Maini and the officers, which resulted in them shooting him dead. Two versions of events emerged in the aftermath. It was reported that Maini had failed to comply after being ordered to get on the ground and that he attacked the officers. They reportedly tried to use non-lethal means of incapacitating the former professional athlete, including a taser, all of which proved ineffective. Fearing for their lives, they then fired their service weapons. Maini was taken to the Queen's Medical Center where he passed away from multiple gunshot injuries. All three officers were hurt and one of them had to be treated for a concussion. The official version of events was challenged in a wrongful death lawsuit filed by Maini's widow, Lindsay, originally from Oahu. She, Maini, and their two children had recently moved to Hawaii. According to the suit, Maini had thought he was visiting a temple which was next door to the property and left when becoming aware his presence in the home was unwanted. 
The suit claimed that Miami had been treated as less than a human being and as an unarmed black man had been racially discriminated by the renters and the arresting officers. Miami had asked, who are you? as a flashlight shone into his eyes and a weapon was pointed at him prior to attacking the officers. Body cam footage indicated that they'd only announced themselves as the police after four shots had already rung out. Footage from a doorbell surveillance camera seemingly confirmed that Miami had mistakenly thought he was visiting a temple as he left them repeatedly apologized to the couple. The homeowner reported that the property had been misidentified as such in the past. Miami was also wearing his Yumikeli, a traditional ceremonial Sulu headband, in homage to the spiritual place he thought he was entering. None of the officers were charged in the incident, and it's unclear if the matter would be reinvestigated. For their part, the Wangs reported that Miami had followed them into the home and filmed them, claiming to be the homeowner, before rummaging through their bedrooms. Police wouldn't confirm if it was the same story they'd shared when detectives first interviewed them. Number 4. Jill Hansen In May of 2014, a surfer was taken to jail with bail set at $1 million on attempted murder charges after hitting an elderly woman with her car. 73-year-old Elizabeth Conklin had no memory of the incident as she woke up in an ambulance. She was taken to a Honolulu hospital with two black eyes and various internal injuries, but her condition was stable. The incident occurred at the Diamond Head Apartments in Waikiki. 30-year-old surfer Jill Hansen, who also modeled her own line of wetsuits, had waited until Conklin exited her vehicle and then rammed her own car into her. As the victim was lying on the ground, Hansen geared up for a second strike but was stopped by a maintenance worker who knocked on her rear window, potentially stopping her from ending the elderly woman's life. While initially reported as a road rage incident, prosecutors would argue that Hansen had run Conklin over because she was driving a BMW, described as her dream car. She jumped in and tried to drive it away but ultimately fled the scene by flagging down a passing motorist. Hansen was tracked down and arrested. Roughly a year after the incident, she was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Multiple clinicians determined that she wasn't in control of her actions at the time having previously stated that voices in her head had told her to run Conklin over. Number 3. Honolulu Plane Crash On July the 28th of 2017, a small plane crashed in a remote mountainous region of Oahu 15 minutes after takeoff, killing its four occupants. They were identified as Virginia woman Heather Riley and her boyfriend, Garrett Evanson, both in their late 20s along with Texas woman Alexis Aaron and pilot Dean Hutton, aged 32 and 29 respectively. Traffic control operators lost communication with the Beach 19A fixed-wing single-engine aircraft shortly after it had departed from Honolulu Airport. It was determined that it had crashed into the mountainside shortly before 7 p.m. The wreckage and bodies were discovered the following day in the Waianae Mountains above Kunia, an investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board attributed the crash to pilot error and found no mechanical issues with the aircraft. It's been reported that after performing several 360-degree loops, Hutton was flying at a low altitude and too close to the mountain. A witness had reported seeing the low-flying aircraft attempt to make a turn and then hearing a boom after it had gone out of view. Number 2. Xerox Massacre the worst mass murder in the history of Hawaii occurred on November the 2nd of 1999 at a Xerox Corporation building in Honolulu. Service technician Brian Koji Uyesugi entered his workplace armed with a Glock 17 handgun and extra ammunition. Shortly after graduating high school in the late 1970s, Uyesugi had crashed his father's car and sustained an injury from smashing his head on the windshield. According to his brother, he wasn't the same afterwards. After he'd started working for Xerox, his colleagues described him as difficult. He made unfounded accusations towards those in his work group of harassment, backstabbing behavior, and the spreading of rumors which ultimately caused them to avoid him. Uyasugi threatened his colleagues' lives and openly talked about carrying out a mass shooting at the building should he ever be let go. Then, 
management began to gradually replace the photocopier that he serviced and Uyesugi resisted learning the new machine but on November the 1st, his manager insisted he begin training. Believing he was on the verge of getting fired, Uyasugi entered the building the following day armed with the Glock. After a brief chat with an employee, he went to the second floor where he gunned down employees Ron Kawame and Jason Balatico in one of the offices. He then entered a conference room where a meeting was taking place. He waved goodbye at the five workers inside, including his supervisor, then executed them. The shooter's rampage resulted in the death of seven colleagues with ages between 33 and 58. Uyasugi fled in a company van and was arrested near the Hawaii Nature Center in Makiki after a five-hour standoff with the police. In the aftermath, the police revealed he had 25 firearms registered in his name. During his trial, doctors determined that he fulfilled the criteria for schizophrenia, but he was deemed competent to stand trial. Hawaii doesn't have the death penalty, and in 2000, the Honolulu-born killer was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 235 years served, the longest sentence ever ordered for a Hawaii inmate. Legislature was passed at state level in the massacre's wake that required doctors to reveal the mental state of people looking to buy guns. Number 1. Honolulu Strangler The Honolulu Strangler, Hawaii's first known serial killer, terrorized the paradisical city in the mid-1980s but was never brought to justice. Active between 1985 and 1986, the Strangler was responsible for the death of at least five women. The first victim was 25-year-old Vicky Gale Purdy, the wife of an army helicopter pilot, who was supposed to meet her friends and go clubbing in Waikiki on May the 29th of 1985. She was last seen alive at around 12 a.m. by the taxi driver who'd driven her back to her car Purdy's lifeless body was found the following morning in an embankment at Kihai Lagoon. Her hands were bound behind her back and she'd been abused and strangled to death. The following two victims were Regina Sakamoto and Denise Hughes, who were killed following the same modus operandi in January of 1986. On February the 5th, a serial killer task force was put together in collaboration with the FBI and the Green River Killer Task Force. The Honolulu Strangler was determined to be an opportunistic killer who didn't stalk his victims but instead preyed on vulnerable women when they were alone at bus stops or other locations. Evidence suggested that to avoid detection, he carried out his crimes in the back of a light-colored van. Two more killings followed. 25-year-old Luis Medeiros disappeared after she told her family she would return by bus from the airport on March the 26th. Road workers found her decomposing body unclothed in the lower half and with the hands bound behind her back near Walkele Stream in early April. The Strangler's last known victim was 36-year-old Linda Pesque. She was reported missing by her roommate after she'd failed to return home from work on April the 29th. In the aftermath of her disappearance, a man named Howard Gay approached the police, claiming that a psychic had told him where to find Pesque's body. He led them to an exact location on Sand Island and, while the body wasn't there, it was eventually recovered elsewhere on the island. Gay was arrested and became the police's most prominent suspect. Two of his former partners had revealed that he partook in bondage, a potentially incriminating fetish considering the nature of the crimes. He also fit the suspected build and age of the killer. Gay was interrogated for hours and took a polygraph test, which came back inconclusive. However, much of the evidence that the authorities had to tie him to the killings was deemed circumstantial. He became a free man and stated, the police have released me, that's all I know. They have plenty of good cause, they're doing their job. The killing stopped following his arrest and release. Gay died of kidney failure in 2003. Several leading members of the task force believed that had DNA testing been available at the time, he would have been confirmed as the Honolulu Strangler. Number 9. Robert Benjamin Smith in November of 1966, Robert Benjamin Smith, aged 18, entered the Rosemar College of Beauty in Mesa, Arizona. Smith was obsessed with famous leaders including Hitler, Caesar, and Napoleon. He was desperate for fame and recognition. After seeing the amount of media coverage the two other U.S. shootings had that year, he ordered everyone inside the college to get on the floor. But one woman was able to run to a store nearby and alert the police. Smith proceeded to kill four women, as well as a small child. He didn't know any of his victims. 
He had planned the kill it spree for over three months. Smith was eventually apprehended and arrested and showed no remorse for what he'd done. He even claimed that he had planned to kill 40 people so that he could make a name for himself. According to Smith, no one had ever paid attention to him and he wanted to change that. Originally, Smith received the death sentence, but after a Supreme Court ruling on the death penalty, his sentence was later commuted to life in prison. Number 8. The Murders of the Flores Gonzalez Household On May the 30th of 2009, Gina Gonzalez, along with her husband, Raul Jr. Flores, and their daughter, Brasinia, were sleeping soundly in their home. There was a knock at the door to which Flores answered. Standing at the door were a woman and two men, they claimed to be law enforcement, and said that they needed to search the house for illegal immigrants. Flores asked why they were there, but he was shot dead by one of the men. Gina and Brasinia were then also shot with only Gina surviving her bullet wound. She played dead until the killers left and afterwards called 911. The group then returned, finding her on the phone. Gina was able to grab a gun and fire it towards the group, causing them to flee the scene. It was later claimed that the group was attempting to raise money for an anti-immigrant organization and they suspected the family were drug smugglers. Shauna Ford, the mastermind behind the attack, orchestrated much of the organization's efforts. Upon their conviction, Ford was sentenced to death for the murders, whilst her accomplices received two life sentences and death. Number 7. Dwight Lamont Jones Dwight Lamont Jones was a mentally ill man suffering from personality disorders and paranoia. He was bitter about his 2010 divorce from Connie Jones, to whom he'd been married for 20 years. Eight years after the divorce, in 2018, he began a killing spree, targeting everyone that had been involved. The murder started on the 31st of May, with the forensic psychiatrist who had diagnosed his mental illness and testified against him in court. Jones then went after his ex-wife's lawyer, but ended up murdering two paralegals. Two days later, Marshall, a 72-year-old life coach and hypnotherapist, was also killed. His actual target was a doctor in the same practice, but Jones discovered the doctor had moved to another office and chose to kill the therapist instead. Connie Jones and her new partner, a retired police officer called Richard Anglin, saw the killings reported in the media and immediately made the connection to Dwight Jones. They informed the police of their suspicion and a manhunt was immediately launched. While this was happening, Jones killed an elderly couple he used to play tennis with Byron Thomas and Mary Simmons, both in their early 70s. The police tracked Jones down to a hotel in anticipation of a potential shootout. Number 6. Jason Derrick Brown Jason Derrick Brown, an FBI top 10 most wanted fugitive, was known as an arrogant playboy with a taste for expensive toys and lavish parties. In November of 2004, he murdered armored car guard Robert Palomares in a movie theater heist. Palomares was shot five times with one of the bullets fatally penetrating his brain. Brown made off on a bicycle with over $50,000 in cash. Fingerprints found at the scene later revealed Brown as the main suspect, as he'd bought a 45 caliber pistol earlier that year and had his fingerprints taken while doing so. Police believe that Brown escaped Arizona in his BMW and that his brother may have helped him to do so. He faces charges of first-degree murder and armed robbery and has so far evaded arrest. The FBI has offered a $200,000 reward for information leading to his capture. Number 5. Gary Triana and Pam Phillips Gary Triana and Pam Phillips formed a well-presented couple in Tucson, Arizona. Both regarded as members of high society, they often mingled with the likes of Donald Trump and his wife at the time. Triana and Phillips had married in 1986 and had two children together. Their life together seemed perfect. The marriage, however, came under pressure seven years later, when Triana's gambling debts began to threaten the financial stability of the family. It eventually led to their divorce in 1993. Thirteen years later, in November of 2006, Triana was getting into his car after playing golf with a friend when a pipe bomb exploded, killing him. Triana was known to do business with members of organized crime, so many thought it had been a contract assassination, 
but investigators found the bomb to be poorly constructed and ruled out Mafia involvement. A few weeks after Triana's death, Pam Phillips came out of the shadows to claim his life insurance policy, which stood at $2 million. This prompted an investigation into Phillips. After looking into previous financial records, law enforcement found that over time, Phillips had paid $40,000 to her new partner, Ronald Young. Investigators then started searching abandoned vehicles, eventually coming by one that had previously been rented by Young. Inside the vehicle, investigators found extensive information related to Triana, such as lists of his known associates, maps, receipts from hotels Triana had stayed at, as well as documents related to Phillips and Triana's divorce. It was enough evidence to charge both Young and Phillips for Triana's murder. The woman's plan had reportedly been set in motion for more than a decade. She and her partner were found guilty and imprisoned. Number four, business dispute kills family. Driss Dyer Edin was the middle brother between his senior brother Dodie and his younger brother Redder. They worked together operating their own limousine business in Phoenix. Acquaintances described the brothers as hard workers. Driss, however, was known to have a temper. On Friday, April the 17th of 2015, the extent of his instability came to light in a horrific way. Acquaintances of the family said that the brothers were having an ongoing business dispute, which eventually sent Driss into a rage. He acquired a semi-automatic handgun and shot both of his brothers, one of their wives, and his own mother. Driss's wife, his two children, and his sister managed to escape the massacre. Authorities were alerted to the gunfire. Police arrived at the house prepared for a shootout and used a megaphone to attempt communication with those inside. When officers eventually moved in to assess the situation, they found nothing but a slain family. Number three, William Craig Miller. William Craig Miller was involved in an arson for hire case, burning down his own house in Scottsdale so that he could claim insurance. Miller owned a home restoration company and enlisted the assistance of his employee, Stephen Duffy, in the arson plot. Weeks later, Duffy's girlfriend contacted the authorities telling them what Miller and Duffy had done. The latter agreed to cooperate with law enforcement as they investigated Miller. Both Duffy and his girlfriend were set to testify against him. This enraged Miller, and he went on a killing spree to eliminate those working against him in the arson and fraud case. Miller shot Duffy and his girlfriend dead, as well as three other family members in their mess at home. Miller escaped the house where he'd executed his victims before the authorities arrived to reports of gunshots. One week later, he staged and reported a burglary at his own house. It was an attempt to mislead the police into thinking that whoever had killed Duffy's family was after him too. It failed, however, when investigators retrieved items at the house which linked Miller to the murders. During the trial, four men came forward testifying that Miller had attempted to enlist each of them as assassins. When that failed, Miller took it upon himself to kill the family. He was convicted of first-degree murder in all cases and sentenced to death a month later. Number 2. The Yarnell Hill Fire The Yarnell Hill Fire was a devastating natural disaster that ripped through 8,400 acres of land in 2011. Started by lightning, the fire spread rapidly due to a drought that the area was experiencing. Another factor which further increased its power and intensity were natural air temperatures of up to 101 degrees Fahrenheit. At one point, 600 firefighters were deployed in the battle against the blaze. The town of Yarnell was evacuated as a precaution. The fire caused widespread destruction, but the deadliest incident that emerged from it was the death of 19 firefighters, part of a 20-man crew, known as the Granite Mountain Hotshots. Brendan McDonough, a lookout for the team, was the sole survivor, having been told by the second-in-command to abandon his post and evacuate. The fire, which was already erratic due to rapidly changing wind conditions, had reportedly trapped the firefighters and obstructed their situational awareness. The Hotshots put down fire shelters in an attempt to shield themselves from the heat. But it wasn't enough. Where the firefighters perished, the wildfire had soared to over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. After the conflagration was contained and the bodies were recovered, the state of Arizona mourned, flying flags at half-mast in honor of the firefighters 
who had also been the only casualties. Barack Obama, who was president at the time, publicly praised their heroic sacrifices. Number 1. Buddhist Temple Murders Considered the worst massacre in Arizona's recent history, the Waddle Buddhist Temple shooting took place on August the 9th of 1991, near Phoenix. On that day, 17-year-old Jonathan Doody and his accomplice, 16-year-old Alessandro Garcia, entered a Buddhist temple armed with guns. They robbed the monks inside of roughly $2,600. According to Garcia, Doody then panicked, thinking one of the monks might have recognized him. Doody then, in an execution-like manner, proceeded to shoot all nine occupants of the temple in the head. Garcia later stated that it had always been the plan not to leave any witnesses behind. Both Doody and Garcia were charged with armed robbery and first-degree murder. They were convicted three years after the massacre and both received several life sentences for their crimes. Number 8. The Circus Circus Casino Heist in 1993, the Circus Circus Casino in Las Vegas was robbed of $2.95 million. Heather Tallchief and her accomplice, Roberto Solis, disappeared from the scene in an armored truck. Over 10 years later, in 2005, Tallchief turned herself in to the Las Vegas authorities. She was sentenced to five years and three months for her role in the robbery. Solis, a criminal with an extensive history in robbery, was never found and none of the stolen money has ever been recovered. Number 7. Esmeralda Gonzalez On May the 31st of 2019, Esmeralda Gonzalez, a Vegas glamour model, was reported missing by her family. Her remains were found five months later encased in a homemade concrete structure in the desert. 24-year-old Esmeralda was reported to have mental problems and it's believed she'd mistakenly entered the home of her killers thinking it was her own. She had recently stopped taking her medication, according to her brother, Christopher Prestopino, 45, and his girlfriend, 31-year-old Lisa Mort, were the occupants of the house. After coaxing her with illegal substances, they tied her to her bed, at which point Esmeralda began to experience a mental breakdown. She threatened to call the police on the deranged couple, which led to Prestopino strangling her to death. She was then injected with poisonous pool cleaner, which investigators believe had been a measure taken to ensure she was dead. Prestopino proceeded to dump Esmeralda's body in the Las Vegas desert, where he encased her with concrete. An investigation was opened into Esmeralda's disappearance, and the tip was given to the police by a friend of Prestopino's. The friend allegedly claimed that Prestopino had told him that he'd killed the missing girl. Prestopino was arrested along with his girlfriend, Mort. He was put on trial and originally faced charges of murder, first-degree kidnapping, and murder conspiracy. However, he was later committed to a mental psychiatry hospital after undergoing professional examination. Mort's charge was listed as conceal and aiding an offender. She later confessed guilty to accessory to murder. Number 6. Murder of Melissa James In December of 2005, a motorist stumbled upon a Jaguar in the middle of the desert. It had been torched, and inside the trunk of the vehicle was the body of 28-year-old Melissa James. Melissa had moved to Vegas only four months earlier, having been coerced by her employer, Craig Titus. Craig and his wife, Kelly Ryan, were fitness industry superstars. Between them, they held multiple bodybuilding titles. Melissa had been employed by the couple as a live-in personal assistant, and although Craig and Kelly denied any involvement in her death, mounting evidence loomed against them. The autopsy revealed Melissa had been strangled, shot with a taser, and injected with a lethal dose of morphine prior to her death. Craig and Kelly were eventually arrested on suspicion of the murder and in 2008, they pled guilty to it. They are currently serving their time in prisons in Nevada. Number 5. The Murder of Tupac Shakur Tupac Shakur was a 25-year-old hip-hop artist from the West Coast. He was murdered in Las Vegas on September the 7th of 1996 in what is thought to have been an organized hit. Tupac was a passenger in a car driven by Suge Knight the founder of Death Row Records. While stopped at a red light, a white four-door Cadillac appeared and drove up to his vehicle. Gunmen inside the Cadillac opened fire on Tupac, and he was hit by four bullets. Two penetrated his chest, one went into his arm, and another into his thigh. Tupac was rushed to the hospital, having initially survived his injuries, but six days later died of cardiac arrest. To this day, the murder of Tupac Shakur remains unsolved, and this has prompted many theories from his devastated fans and the hip-hop community. 
Some of them proposed the hit had been ordered by Suge Knight himself. Rival music groups from the East Coast or even that Tupac had staged his death and is in fact still alive. Number 4. Pipe Bombing at the Luxor The Luxor, a luxury hotel and casino in Vegas, was hit by a pipe bomb attack on May the 7th of 2007. The pipe bomb was sophisticated, having been disguised as a coffee cup. It was placed in the parking garage on top of 24-year-old Willibaldo Antonio's car. Equipped with a motion trigger as Antonio went to his vehicle, it blew up, killing him. The creator of the bomb had allegedly built it for his friend, who was jealous that Antonio was dating his former girlfriend. The two suspects were arrested and sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. Number 3. Arson at the Las Vegas Hilton In 1981, a 23-year-old busboy at the Hilton Hotel in Las Vegas made headlines as he started a fire in the elevator lobby. Philip Klein, described as a troubled young man, was initially thought to have tried to put the fire out, but it was later determined he had intentionally started the blaze. The fire spread through the hotel fast and trapped guests in their rooms. Over 200 people were injured and eight people died. Klein was convicted of the eight counts of murder and confessed to the arson in a jail interview. He said that he'd purposefully used the lighter to set fire to some curtains. Number 2. Tony Carlio One morning in December of 2010, Tony Carlio, who'd become known as the Biker Bandit, set his sights on the Bellagio Hotel and Casino. Five days prior, Tony had successfully robbed another casino, the Sun Coast. He'd held up the poker room and had made it out with $19,000 in cash. It was his first casino robbery and he intended to carry forward the momentum he had built, wearing dark overalls, gloves, and a motorcycle helmet. Tony walked towards the Bellagio with a gun hidden in his right pocket. He casually exchanged waves with an elderly security guard as he walked through the entrance. Although the casino was quiet in the early hours, he knew his presence would quickly raise the alarm. Tony went straight for a high-limit craps table and pulled out his gun. In front of him lay chips worth millions of dollars. Tony threw handfuls of chips into a backpack as fast as he could before he fled from the casino to his motorcycle outside. Speeding away from the crime scene, Tony has successfully made off with one and a half million dollars in his backpack. Tony returned to the casino regularly to convert his stolen chips into cash he could use. Posing as a regular player, he would sneak the stolen chips into his stack at the games he joined. The first time he did this was the day after the robbery and at one point, he even joined the same craps table that he had robbed. He cashed out successfully multiple times. With his newfound fortune, Tony began to live the high life, indulging in everything Vegas had to offer. Meanwhile, detectives looking into the high-profile case were coming up with no leads. That was until Tony was flagged by the Bellagio's computer systems. Over $1 million of the chips Tony had stolen were $25 chips, known as cranberries due to their color. Players capable of holding these chips have a history of playing the highest of stakes at the casino, and the Bellagio have digital records of these high rollers. On these records, the name Tony Carlio was nowhere to be found. This drew suspicions from the casino, and Tony's name was passed over to the police investigation. However, even with this information, the authorities still didn't have any evidence that Tony had committed the heist. That was until Tony's greed got the better of him. He had begun posting on a poker forum online in an attempt to find local players who would pay him smaller denomination chips for his cranberries. He provided one user of the forum proof that he held the cranberries he claimed to have, and out of pride, supplied evidence that he was the infamous biker bandit. The user forwarded this information to the authorities. Now, evidence was beginning to stack up against Tony. An undercover police officer working on the investigation soon befriended him, and the two worked out deals for Tony's chips. Then, one day after the cash had exchanged hands, the undercover officer walked off without a word. Six police officers appeared, surprising Tony and giving him no opportunity for escape. They forced him to the ground and handcuffed him. Just seven weeks after pulling off the heist, Tony was arrested and paraded out the doors of the Bellagio. He was sentenced to nine years in prison for his crimes. He reportedly regrets not being able to pull the heist off just as much as he regrets committing it in the first place. Number 1. Murder of Ted Binion Ted Binion was a high-rolling gambling executive. His father, Benny Binion, was a casino business magnate and a well-known personality in Vegas. 
In 1998, Ted was found dead in his Las Vegas home. An autopsy revealed a cocktail of drugs, both prescription and illegal, in Ted's system. Initially thought to be an accidental suicide due to Ted's known addictions, detectives reclassified his death as homicide six months later, believing that it had been staged. In June of 1999, Ted's former girlfriend, along with her lover at the time, were arrested on suspicion of murder. The couple was also charged with robbery, grand larceny, and burglary, due to Ted's vault having been emptied. However, four years later, in 2003, their convictions were overturned by the Supreme Court. The court ruled that the judge had erred in his instructions to the jury during the couple's original trial. They were retried in 2004, when they were both acquitted of murder and instead were convicted on lesser charges. The couple has since been released from prison. Number 8. Victor Cuevas In 2017, Victor Cuevas was accused of fatally shooting a man outside the Bella Terra shopping mall in Richmond. He was subsequently released on a 125,000 bond, but in May of 2021, Cuevas once again found himself in front of a judge. This time it was because his pet Bengal tiger, India, was spotted prowling through a Houston neighborhood. The tiger came face to face with an off-duty Waller County deputy before being pulled away by his owner. As the police arrived at the scene, Cuevas evaded arrest and fled with the 175-pound beast in the back of his SUV. While it's legal to own a tiger in Texas, it can't be held within city limits. Cuevas was arrested, but India remained missing for roughly eight days. There was significant concern from the public that a tiger was on the loose in Houston. After moving India through various safe houses, Cuevas' wife, Gia, eventually turned him into Houston PD. The tiger was relocated to a wildlife sanctuary in Murchison. Cuevas' initial bond was revoked and a new one was set at $300,000, which he also paid and was, once again, released from custody pending a trial. Number 7. Alan Bard In 2019, a Corpus Christi man led the authorities on an unconventional chase as he tried to evade capture in his tractor. 45-year-old Alan Bard had rear-ended a vehicle and then got into a confrontation with the driver. When the police arrived at the scene, an officer approached Bard with the intention of bringing him into custody. It was at that moment that Bard drove off in his John Deere tractor, dragging the officer with him. It was later reported that the officer had sustained injuries to his shoulder. Bard then engaged the police in an hour-long chase. Two 4x4 squad cars trailed him into a field. Another officer then cut off the tractor and held Bard at gunpoint, effectively putting an end to the pursuit. He was removed from the vehicle and detained on charges of evading arrest and aggravated assault of a police officer. Number 6. Brenda Delgado In 2019, Brenda Delgado was sentenced to life in prison for masterminding the murder of Kendra Hatcher out of jealous rage. In 2015, Delgado's boyfriend, Ricardo Paniagua, ended their relationship after the pair had been seeing each other on and off for several years. Paniagua felt that they'd left things on a positive note but had no idea of the obsession Delgado harbored towards him. The 33-year-old tracked his whereabouts via the GPS in his phone and routinely monitored his emails and messages. A few months after the breakup, Paniagua met pediatric dentist Kendra Hatcher on an online dating site. Upon learning that Paniagua had flown his new girlfriend out to San Francisco to meet his parents, Delgado's jealousy reached a boiling point and she made the decision to kill her perceived rival. She enlisted accomplices, 27-year-old Crystal Cortez and Christopher Love, aged 35. Delgado promised the money and drugs through unsubstantiated claims that she had cartel connections. Love acted as the trigger man and Cortez was meant to be the getaway driver. Delgado had told them to cover their tracks by making the killing look like a robbery. On September the 2nd of 2015, Love fatally shot Hatcher in the back of the head in the parking lot of her Dallas apartment complex. A few weeks later, the accomplices were arrested, but by that point, Delgado had fled to Mexico where she had citizenship. She was placed on the FBI's most wanted list with a $100,000 reward for information leading to her capture. After a few months spent in hiding, she was arrested in Mexico and extradited to the US on the condition that capital punishment won't be pursued. Cortez, who testified against the other two, was sentenced to 35 years with parole, while Love was sentenced to death via lethal injection. Number 5. Samantha Lopez In late May of 2021, 
a woman was gunned down in San Antonio in front of her young children. At around 7 a.m., Samantha Lopez was getting her daughters ready for school outside MC Belden Apartments. The attacker approached 28-year-old Lopez and shot her once from behind and then again as she lay on the ground. The children aged 2, 6 and 10 are believed to have witnessed the murder but were unharmed. An unnamed man identified as the woman's estranged husband was brought in for questioning. Lopez had had a protective order against him and he'd been arrested multiple times for violating it. According to a preliminary investigation, the estranged husband was the main suspect in the shooting, but he hasn't been officially charged at this point in time. Number 4. Charles Albright Charles Albright was one of the most terrifying serial killers to operate in the state of Texas, also known as the Eyeball Killer. He was arrested for one murder in 1991, but is strongly suspected to have committed at least another two. In December of 1990, Mary Lou Pratt, a well-known prostitute in Dallas's Oak Cliff neighborhood, was found dead, only clothed in a bra and t-shirt. 33-year-old Pratt had been badly beaten and then shot in the head. A coroner stated that the killer had taken both her eyes after removing them with surgical precision. In February of the following year, 27-year-old Susan Beth Peterson, who was also a prostitute, was found on the same street as Platt. She'd been shot in her left breast as well as in the back and through the top of her head. The killer had removed both her eyes. In March, the nude body of Shirley Williams was found propped up against the curb near an elementary school. When a medical field agent pulled back her eyelids, he realized her eyes were missing. Like the previous two, she'd been beaten and shot in the head. The authorities were only able to concretely connect Albright to Williams's murder through hair found at the scene that matched his, as the rest of the evidence was deemed circumstantial. Albright was imprisoned at a psychiatric unit in Le Boc, where he died in 2020. Number 3. Murder of Adrian Wells In 2019, a young man was killed in Dallas in a robbery gone awry. The day after 18-year-old Sidney Whitaker had first met Adrian Wells, aged 21, she called him to meet at his apartment, promising intimate relations. Wells was lured outside, at which point three armed robbers forced him back into the apartment, demanding cash. The intruders opened fire upon discovering there were other people at the residence. Wells was fatally shot while a 45-year-old man, whose identity wasn't released, was critically wounded. A witness would report that after hearing the gunshots, he saw Whitaker who bore a distinctive facial tattoo running from the area. When asked if she was all right, the teenager replied, no. She then called the police saying that she had information about Wells' murder but didn't show up at the station after agreeing to an interview. She was eventually arrested and charged with capital murder along with Tyrone Williams and Jeroy Rogers, both in their early 20s. Number 2. Genesis Corneo Alvarado the murder of Genesis Corneo Alvarado is among the most brutal to have occurred in Texas in recent years. On February the 16th of 2017, the body of a teenager who'd been shot twice at close range was found on Sharpcrest Street in southwest Houston. In March, the body was identified as that of Corneo, who had been reported missing about a month prior. The 15-year-old and another teenager had been kidnapped and held captive by Miguel Alvarez Flores and Diego Hernandez Rivera. The illegal immigrants from El Salvador were self-described Satanists and members of the MS-13 gang. After kidnapping Corneo, they gave her drugs and abused her for a month. The other teenage victim went through the same ordeal and was also forcibly tattooed by Alvarez. She was able to escape and led the authorities back to the men while also giving an account of the circumstances surrounding Corneo's murder. She'd reportedly been killed for criticizing a satanic statue nicknamed The Beast, which was at the apartment. Alvarez took offense and, after offering the shrine a cigarette, claimed that it wanted a soul instead. Hernandez confessed to the killing after the pair was arrested. They were each sentenced to 40 years for murder and aggravated kidnapping. During their arraignment, they caused public outcry as they laughed and waved at the cameras. Number 1. Sutherland Springs Church Shooting On November 5, 2017, Devin Patrick Kelly parked his Ford Explorer SUV in the front of the First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs and emerged armed with a Ruger AR-556 semi-automatic rifle. Kelly, who was wearing a bulletproof vest and a black face mask with a white skull on it, gunned down two people in front of the church. He continued firing on the building where people were attending Sunday service and then entered shouting, everybody dies. 
Kelly walked up and down the center aisle, methodically shooting worshippers in the pews and pausing only to reload his weapon. During the 11-minute spree, he fired more than 700 rounds. He claimed 26 victims and injured 20 others. In what would become the deadliest mass shooting in Texas history, Kelly then entered a fire exchange with resident and former NRA shooting instructor Stephen Williford. Also armed with an AR-15 variant, he'd taken cover behind a truck and shot Kelly twice in the leg and in the upper torso, causing him to drop his rifle. Before speeding away in his SUV, Kelly returned fire with a handgun. Williford then entered a pickup truck, driven by a man named Johnny Langendorf, and the two started pursuing Kelly. The men called 911 during the seven-minute chase in which they reached speeds of up to 95 miles per hour. Kelly eventually slammed into a road sign, crossed the borrow ditch, and came to a stop in a field. The police would find his lifeless body inside the vehicle with three gunshot injuries, including a self-inflicted one to the head, in spite of speculation towards his affiliation with various extreme groups or that the shooting had been motivated by religious prejudice or racism. Investigators ultimately attributed it to Kelly's own fragile mental state and the dispute he'd had with his mother-in-law. Number 8. Victor Cuevas In 2017, Victor Cuevas was accused of fatally shooting a man outside the Bellaterra shopping mall in Richmond. He was subsequently released on a 125,000 bond, but in May of 2021, Cuevas once again found himself in front of a judge. This time it was because his pet Bengal tiger, India, was spotted prowling through a Houston neighborhood. The tiger came face to face with an off-duty Walla County deputy before being pulled away by his owner. As the police arrived at the scene, Cuevas evaded arrest and fled with the 175-pound beast in the back of his SUV. While it's legal to own a tiger in Texas, it can't be held within city limits. Cuevas was arrested, but India remained missing for roughly eight days. There was significant concern from the public that a tiger was on the loose in Houston. After moving India through various safe houses, Cuevas' wife, Gia, eventually turned him into Houston PD. The tiger was relocated to a wildlife sanctuary in Murchison. Cuevas' initial bond was revoked and a new one was set at $300,000, which he also paid and was once again released from custody pending a trial. Number 7. Alan Bard in 2019, a Corpus Christi man led the authorities on an unconventional chase as he tried to evade capture in his tractor. 45-year-old Alan Bard had rear-ended a vehicle and then got into a confrontation with the driver. When the police arrived at the scene, an officer approached Bard with the intention of bringing him into custody. It was at that moment that Bard drove off in his John Deere tractor, dragging the officer with him. It was later reported that the officer had sustained injuries to his shoulder. Bard then engaged the police in an hour-long chase. Two 4x4 squad cars trailed him into a field. Another officer then cut off the tractor and held Bard at gunpoint, effectively putting an end to the pursuit. He was removed from the vehicle and detained on charges of evading arrest and aggravated assault of a police officer. Number 6. Brenda Delgado In 2019, Brenda Delgado was sentenced to life in prison for masterminding the murder of Kendra Hatcher out of jealous rage. In 2015, Delgado's boyfriend, Ricardo Paniagua, ended their relationship after the pair had been seeing each other on and off for several years. Paniagua felt that they'd left things on a positive note, but had no idea of the obsession Delgado harbored towards him. The 33-year-old tracked his whereabouts via the GPS in his phone and routinely monitored his emails and messages. A few months after the breakup, Paniagua met pediatric dentist Kendra Hatcher on an online dating site. Upon learning that Paniagua had flown his new girlfriend out to San Francisco to meet his parents, Delgado's jealousy reached a boiling point and she made the decision to kill her perceived rival. She enlisted accomplices, 27-year-old Crystal Cortez and Christopher Love, aged 35. Delgado promised the money and drugs through unsubstantiated claims that she had cartel connections. Love acted as the trigger man and Cortez was meant to be the getaway driver. Delgado had told them to cover their tracks by making the killing look like a robbery. On September the 2nd of 2015, Love fatally shot Hatcher in the back of the head in the parking lot of her Dallas apartment complex. A few weeks later, the accomplices were arrested, but by that point, Delgado had fled to Mexico where she had citizenship. She was placed on the FBI's most wanted list with a $100,000 reward for information leading to her capture. After a few months spent in hiding, she was arrested in Mexico and 
extradited to the US on the condition that capital punishment won't be pursued. Cortez, who testified against the other two, was sentenced to 35 years with parole, while Love was sentenced to death via lethal injection. Number 5. Samantha Lopez In late May of 2021, a woman was gunned down in San Antonio in front of her young children. At around 7 a.m., Samantha Lopez was getting her daughters ready for school outside MC Belden Apartments. The attacker approached 28-year-old Lopez and shot her once from behind and then again as she lay on the ground. The children aged 2, 6 and 10 are believed to have witnessed the murder but were unharmed. An unnamed man identified as the woman's estranged husband was brought in for questioning. Lopez had had a protective order against him and he'd been arrested multiple times for violating it. According to a preliminary investigation, the estranged husband was the main suspect in the shooting, but he hasn't been officially charged at this point in time. Number 4. Charles Albright Charles Albright was one of the most terrifying serial killers to operate in the state of Texas, also known as the Eyeball Killer. He was arrested for one murder in 1991, but is strongly suspected to have committed at least another two. In December of 1990, Mary Lou Pratt, a well-known prostitute in Dallas's Oak Cliff neighborhood, was found dead, only clothed in a bra and t-shirt. 33-year-old Pratt had been badly beaten and then shot in the head. A coroner stated that the killer had taken both her eyes after removing them with surgical precision. In February of the following year, 27-year-old Susan Beth Peterson, who was also a prostitute, was found on the same street as Platt. She'd been shot in her left breast as well as in the back and through the top of her head. The killer had removed both her eyes. In March, the nude body of Shirley Williams was found propped up against the curb near an elementary school. When a medical field agent pulled back her eyelids, he realized her eyes were missing. Like the previous two, she'd been beaten and shot in the head. The authorities were only able to concretely connect Albright to Williams' murder through hair found at the scene that matched his, as the rest of the evidence was deemed circumstantial. Albright was imprisoned at a psychiatric unit in Le Boc, where he died in 2020. Number 3. Murder of Adrian Wells In 2019, a young man was killed in Dallas in a robbery gone awry. The day after 18-year-old Sidney Whitaker had first met Adrian Wells, aged 21, she called him to meet at his apartment, promising intimate relations. Wells was lured outside, at which point three armed robbers forced him back into the apartment, demanding cash. The intruders opened fire upon discovering there were other people at the residence. Wells was fatally shot while a 45-year-old man, whose identity wasn't released, was critically wounded. A witness would report that after hearing the gunshots, he saw Whitaker who bore a distinctive facial tattoo running from the area. When asked if she was all right, the teenager replied, no. She then called the police saying that she had information about Wells' murder but didn't show up at the station after agreeing to an interview. She was eventually arrested and charged with capital murder along with Tyrone Williams and Jeroy Rogers, both in their early 20s. Number 2. Genesis Corneo Alvarado the murder of Genesis Corneo Alvarado is among the most brutal to have occurred in Texas in recent years. On February the 16th of 2017, the body of a teenager who'd been shot twice at close range was found on Sharpcrest Street in southwest Houston. In March, the body was identified as that of Corneo, who had been reported missing about a month prior. The 15-year-old and another teenager had been kidnapped and held captive by Miguel Alvarez Flores and Diego Hernandez Rivera. The illegal immigrants from El Salvador were self-described Satanists and members of the MS-13 gang. After kidnapping Corneo, they gave her drugs and abused her for a month. The other teenage victim went through the same ordeal and was also forcibly tattooed by Alvarez. She was able to escape and led the authorities back to the men while also giving an account of the circumstances surrounding Corneo's murder. She'd reportedly been killed for criticizing a satanic statue nicknamed The Beast, which was at the apartment. Alvarez took offense and, after offering the shrine a cigarette, claimed that it wanted a soul instead. Hernandez confessed to the killing after the pair was arrested. They were each sentenced to 40 years for murder and aggravated kidnapping. During their arraignment, they caused public outcry as they laughed and waved at the cameras. Number 1. Sutherland Springs Church Shooting On November 5th of 2017, Devin Patrick Kelly parked his Ford Explorer SUV in the front of the First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs, 
and emerged armed with a Ruger AR-556 semi-automatic rifle. Kelly, who was wearing a bulletproof vest and a black face mask with a white skull on it, gunned down two people in front of the church. He continued firing on the building where people were attending Sunday service and then entered shouting, everybody dies. Kelly walked up and down the center aisle, methodically shooting worshippers in the pews and pausing only to reload his weapon. During the 11-minute spree, he fired more than 700 rounds. He claimed 26 victims and injured 20 others. In what would become the deadliest mass shooting in Texas history, Kelly then entered a fire exchange with resident and former NRA shooting instructor Stephen Williford. Also armed with an AR-15 variant, he'd taken cover behind a truck and shot Kelly twice in the leg and in the upper torso, causing him to drop his rifle. Before speeding away in his SUV, Kelly returned fire with a handgun. Williford then entered a pickup truck, driven by a man named Johnny Langendorf, and the two started pursuing Kelly. The men called 911 during the seven-minute chase in which they reached speeds of up to 95 miles per hour. Kelly eventually slammed into a road sign, crossed the borrow ditch, and came to a stop in a field. The police would find his lifeless body inside the vehicle with three gunshot injuries, including a self-inflicted one to the head. In spite of speculation towards his affiliation with various extreme groups, or that the shooting had been motivated by religious prejudice or racism, investigators ultimately attributed it to Kelly's own fragile mental state and the dispute he'd had with his mother-in-law. Number 7. Peter Chadwick On October the 10th of 2012, police were called to a home in Newport Beach, belonging to millionaire Peter Chadwick and his wife, Ki Chu. A welfare check had been requested after neither of the homeowners had picked up their children from their private school in Huntington Beach that day. After gaining access to the residence, officers reportedly found several pieces of evidence that suggested a violent altercation had taken place. The clues included a broken vase and bloodstains in an upstairs bathroom. It was also discovered that a safe in one of the downstairs offices had been emptied and left open. The following day, Chadwick called 911 from a payphone to report that his wife had been murdered by a house painter named Juan. During the man's subsequent interviews with the police, detectives noticed scratches on his neck and dried blood on his hands, and it was ultimately determined that Juan had been a fabrication. Chadwick was thus arrested on suspicion of murdering his wife. Two months later, he was released on a million dollars bail on the condition that he surrendered his passports. Chadwick reportedly moved in with his father in Santa Barbara for the next couple of years, but in 2015, he failed to show up for a scheduled court hearing. An investigation into his whereabouts was set into motion and US Marshals quickly uncovered that the man had recently withdrawn millions from his bank accounts. The manhunt continued for more than four years until Chadwick was finally located near Puebla, Mexico, where he was taken into custody with the help of local authorities. It subsequently emerged that the millionaire fugitive had posed as a spy and used a fake ID card from the Marvel TV show Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. while on the run. Chadwick pleaded guilty to strangling and drowning his wife in the bathroom of their Newport Beach mansion before discarding her body in a dumpster in San Diego. He was ultimately sentenced to 15 years to life in prison in February of 2022. Number 6. Alexandra Suvaneva A forest fire broke out roughly 12 miles from the city of Reading on the east side of Interstate 5 on September the 22nd of 2021. During the next 10 days, the blaze, dubbed the Fawn Fire, burned an estimated 8,578 acres of land, destroying 185 buildings and damaging another 26. Three firefighters were reported to have been injured while working to contain the rapidly expanding flames. It was ultimately determined that the fire had been deliberately started by Palo Alto resident Alexandra Suvaneva, aged 30. She had been spotted trespassing on a remote canyon property belonging to J.F. Shea and Mountain Gate Quarries. On the morning of the fire's ignition, court records detailed how Suvaneva had been found by law enforcement officers with a bag containing CO2 cartridges and a cigarette lighter. She was consequently booked into the Shasta County Jail on suspicion of forest land arson. The woman was reportedly dehydrated when fire department personnel came upon her in the brush near the fire line. In November of 2021, a judge declared that Suvaneva was mentally unfit to stand trial, and her case was thereupon placed on hold until she could be evaluated for placement in a mental institution. Number 5. Joseph Jimenez TikTok star Anthony Barajas, aged 19, went to a movie theater in Corona, California with a female companion on the evening of July the 26th of 2021. 
Following the theater's final showing of the night, an employee reportedly found that the two teens had been left critically injured after being shot in the head as they sat in their seats. Barajas' friend, identified as 18-year-old Riley Goodrich, was already dead upon the arrival of first responders. Barajas was rushed to the hospital where he was kept on life support for several days following the incident. With the help of eyewitness testimony, authorities were able to identify 20-year-old Joseph Jimenez as the main suspect in the case. Investigators reportedly found that the alleged gunman had no prior relationship with either of the two victims and it was concluded that the attack had been completely unprovoked and devoid of any clear-cut motive. Jimenez was booked into the Riverside Presley Detention Center and charged with the murder of Goodrich and attempted murder of Barajas. On August the 1st, it was reported that the latter had succumbed to his injuries while being treated at the hospital, at which point Jimenez's charges were amended to include a second murder count. In an interview with the Riverside Press Enterprise, the suspect claimed that he'd been driven to commit the double homicide by voices in his head, which had purportedly told him that his family would be killed if he refused to do as they demanded. Number 4. Eric John Montgomery and Peaches Sochef On the morning of November the 28th of 2018, narcotics detectives searched the Visalia residence of Eric John Montgomery and Peaches Sochef. The officers were reportedly joined by a special enforcement unit and the Tula Area Regional Gang Enforcement Team during the search, which ended with both homeowners being taken into custody. The suspects were subsequently booked into the Tula County Pre-Trial Facility on suspicion of possession of illegal substances with the intent to distribute. In the wake of the couple's arrest, Montgomery's mugshot went viral on social media. The strong reactions to the photograph were in large part due to the presence of a bulbous growth on the man's forehead. Officers claimed that the bump stemmed from a medical condition from which the man suffered. They maintained that it had no connection to the police's handling of Montgomery during his arrest, as had been theorized by some. The suspect's bail was set at $50,000 each. Number 3. The Golden Gate Bridge Daredevils Two self-professed daredevils from Allenton, Wisconsin, took a trip to San Francisco in April of 2017 with the intention of climbing the Golden Gate Bridge. The pair were identified as 18-year-old YouTuber Peter Cura and his exploration companion Thomas Rector, aged 21. As was captured in a five-minute clip later posted online, the two young men climbed to the top of the landmark bridge's north tower. They were shown performing backflips and somersaults on some of the structure's narrow walkways during the ascent. At one point in the video, Cura and Rector were dangling over the edge of the 746-foot tower by their fingertips, all without the aid of any safety equipment. While the pair fortunately came away from the reckless stunt without any injuries, they did face legal trouble once the footage of their escapade began circulating on social media. The Marin County District Attorney ordered that both Cura and Rector appear in court on charges of misdemeanor trespassing and climbing a toll bridge. The maximum penalty associated with their charges was one year behind bars. However, in October of 2017, it was reported that the Daredevil duo had plans to take a plea deal that would spare them any jail time. Number 2. William Wallace After leaving a neighbor's Christmas Eve party in 2011, William Wallace got into a heated argument with his girlfriend college student Zazel Preston at their Anaheim residence. The man was said to have flown into a drunken rage as the dispute escalated and he pushed Preston into a glass table which reportedly shattered upon impact. During the case's subsequent trial, the woman's eldest daughter recounted how she'd helped pull shards of broken glass from her mother's body before Wallace carried her into the bathroom to clean her wounds. As he did so, however, he lost his grasp of Preston and the woman's head consequently smashed into the toilet seat. Preston's daughter remembered that her mother's body was cold as Wallace brought her into their shared bedroom. The following morning, as the children were opening their Christmas presents, Wallace dragged Preston into the living room and propped her body up on the couch before placing a pair of sunglasses over her eyes. He reportedly told the children that mummy got drunk and ruined Christmas. Paramedics were later called to the home where they found Preston's body slumped over the sofa. She was pronounced dead at the scene. During a search of the apartment, Investigators found multiple blood stains in various rooms as well as a door that had been knocked off its hinges and a hole in a wall that had presumably been caused by a punch. Preston's relatives described Wallace as controlling and violent and claimed that the couple had been involved in several other incidents of domestic violence in the past before her tragic death. Preston was mere weeks from graduating with a degree from Cypress College 
with a future plan of becoming a domestic violence counsellor. In June of 2021, Wallace was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison following his conviction on the charge of second-degree murder. Number 1. The Golden State Killer Sacramento County Sheriff's deputies took former police officer Joseph James D'Angelo into custody on April the 24th of 2018. The arrest was the culmination of a decades-long investigation into the identity of the Golden State Killer, a nickname given to the previously unknown perpetrator of a series of brutal crimes across California between 1974 and 1986. D'Angelo was suspected to have carried out three separate crime sprees in different regions of the state, each of which spawned different nicknames in the press. Investigators initially believed that the 13 murders, 50 assaults and 120 burglaries had been committed by three different suspects. It was eventually determined that a single individual had been responsible for all of the crimes, and the suspect was given the name Golden State Killer by crime writer Michelle McNamara. Police identified several suspects throughout the investigation, all of whom were gradually exonerated by DNA testing, alibi, or some other piece of exculpatory evidence. In June of 2016, the FBI announced that they were renewing their efforts to identify the infamous serial killer and offered a $50,000 reward for his capture. Four months before the arrest was made, officials had uploaded a DNA profile of the suspect to the personal genomics website GED Match. With the help of genealogist Barbara Way Venter, two possible Golden State Killer identities emerged, one of whom was subsequently ruled out by a relative's DNA test. At that point, the only remaining suspect was D'Angelo, whose DNA was collected from the handle of his car door. It was reported that neither his wife nor his children had suspected him of any wrongdoing and were therefore shocked and devastated upon hearing the details of his gruesome crimes. In August of 2020, D'Angelo, who by that time was 74 years old, pleaded guilty to a slew of charges and was ultimately sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 8. William Wood In the early morning hours of September the 15th of 2018, a masked gunman entered a Chili's in the town of DeWitt while employees were closing up the establishment. The suspect ordered three of the workers to get on the floor, then pointed the firearm at the manager, identified as Stephen Gudnecht, and demanded he open the safe. Upon doing so, however, Gudnecht revealed that the restaurant had very little cash on hand, to which the gunman reacted by fatally shooting him in the head. The assailant subsequently walked over to the other employees and fired a round at Christopher Hicks, who later died while being transported to the hospital. The gunman attempted to shoot another worker, but his weapon malfunctioned and he fled the scene. The employees who'd survived the ambush attack promptly called the police. It soon emerged that the individual responsible for the deadly robbery was a disgruntled former Chili's employee named William Wood. In August of 2021, the 33-year-old pleaded guilty to one count of robbery and two counts of using a firearm in the furtherance of a crime of violence and murder. Although prosecutors initially announced their plans to seek the death penalty for Wood, he was ultimately sentenced to two life terms instead. Number 7. Javier Da Silva On the night of January the 28th of 2019, Valerie Reyes frantically called her mother to express her pervasive feelings of anxiety, stemming from the belief that someone was going to try to kill her. The next day, the 24-year-old went missing from her home in the small upstate town of New Rochelle, triggering a widespread search effort that extended into neighboring states. A week after Reyes's initial disappearance, the authorities located her lifeless body inside a suitcase that had been discarded on the side of the highway in Greenwich, Connecticut. In the immediate aftermath of her remains being discovered, Reyes's ex-boyfriend was identified as a possible suspect in her kidnapping and murder, as the pair had just broken up shortly before she went missing. On February the 12th, however, the police in Greenwich arrested another of Reyes's ex-boyfriends, Javier Da Silva, whose relationship with the victim had reportedly come to an end in mid-2018, as was discovered during a subsequent police investigation. Da Silva, aged 24, had driven to Reyes's apartment in the early morning hours of January the 29th. They got into an altercation during which Reyes 
reportedly suffered head trauma and bruising to her face. In the moments that followed, De Silva bound and gagged the young woman before stuffing her inside a suitcase and using her debit card to withdraw $1,000 at an ATM in New Rochelle. He then drove to Greenwich, where he dumped the suitcase in a wooded area off of Glenville Road. In September of 2021, De Silva was convicted of Reyes' murder and he was consequently sentenced to 30 years in federal prison. Number 6. Brianna Scarpula On June the 10th of 2018, Brianna Scarpula was traveling down Latter Road in the town of Greece at a speed of over 70 miles per hour. Her best friend and fellow Hilton High School varsity cheerleader Paige Smith was in the car with her at the time. Subsequent reports detailed how Scarpula was attempting to get the attention of passengers in another vehicle on the roadway when she suddenly lost control of her own car. The 18-year-old then overcorrected her vehicle's path, causing it to cross over the painted center line and crash directly into an oncoming SUV. Both Scarpula and Smith were left in critical condition following the violent collision and the latter ultimately passed away as a result of her extensive injuries. The driver of the SUV, later named as Mary Kay Mayuri, was reported to have suffered a broken left foot and ankle in the crash, requiring her to undergo multiple reconstructive surgeries. After spending about two weeks at Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester, Scarpula was released shortly before Hilton High School's graduation ceremony. The teenager's toxicology report indicated that she hadn't been under the influence of drugs or alcohol at the time of the fatal accident. In June of 2019, she pleaded guilty to charges of criminally negligent homicide and reckless driving. As part of her plea agreement with prosecutors, Scarpula was sentenced to one to three years of probation. Number 5. Winston Glynn on January the 9th of 2022, a man walked into a Burger King in Manhattan and struck the manager on duty with a handgun. He proceeded to attack one of the two customers that were in the restaurant at the time as well, and then pointed the gun at the cashier and demanded money. The employee, later named as 19-year-old Crystal Bayron Neves, complied with the armed man's commands and reportedly handed him $100 from the cash register. The assailant fatally shot Bayron Neves in the stomach in spite of her cooperation before stealing the manager's cell phone and fleeing the scene. The New York Police Department subsequently released surveillance footage of the suspect, who was eventually identified as a homeless man named Winston Glynn. The 30-year-old was taken into police custody on January the 13th, and he reportedly faced the charge of murder in addition to other felony offenses. The authorities revealed that Glynn had seven prior arrests on his record stemming from instances of menacing, criminal possession of a weapon, and assault. On the same night as Glynn's capture, a candle-lit vigil was held in Bayron Neves' honor outside the Burger King where she'd worked. Number 4. The Assault and Robbery of Nina Rothschild A researcher for New York City's Department of Health was making her way into a Queens subway station after work on February the 24th of 2022 when she was suddenly attacked by a man wielding a hammer. Surveillance footage taken from outside the station showed the suspect walking with a cane as he approached the victim, 58-year-old Nina Rothschild. The latter had begun walking down the stairs to the subway platform when the man kicked her in the back, apparently attempting to knock her over. Rothschild stayed on her feet and attempted to flee, but the assailant then took out a hammer and bashed the woman over the head an estimated 13 times. The victim was taken to Weill Cornell Medicine in critical condition after her attacker, later named as career criminal William Blunt, absconded with her purse which contained a cell phone, bank cards, and an unknown sum of cash. On February the 27th, Blunt was arrested and charged with attempted murder, robbery, and assault. A second suspect, Queen's resident Denise Alston, was taken into police custody in connection to the incident. She'd reportedly used Rothschild's stolen credit card the day after the attack and consequently faced several charges including criminal possession of stolen property and identity theft. Number 3. Asmad Nash Manhattan advertising professional Christina Yuna Lee returned to her Chinatown residence in the early hours of February the 13th of 2022 after spending the night at a club. Upon entering her apartment, the 35-year-old was brutally attacked by a man who followed her home. According to the resulting police report, Lee was stabbed over 40 times with one of her kitchen knives. Neighbors who'd been awakened by her pained cries for help 
promptly called 911. Police officers had been patrolling an area nearby when the call went out, which allowed them to descend upon Lee's apartment almost instantly. By that time, the assailant had barricaded himself inside the home, and it reportedly took the officers about 90 minutes to finally gain entry. They then found Lee's mutilated body unclothed inside her bathtub. The officers also came upon her bloodied killer, identified as Asmad Nash, who was hiding underneath the bed with a bloody wound on his torso, as well as lacerations to his hands and shoulder. The knife, believed to have been used during the fatal attack, was located behind a dresser in the victim's bedroom. It subsequently emerged that leading up to the gruesome murder, Nash had been arrested a total of seven times since 2017 and still had three open cases at Manhattan Criminal Court. Number 2. Michael J. Snow SUNY Potsdam student Elizabeth Howell was found unconscious on the side of the road near the university's Crane School of Music on the evening of February the 18th of 2022. Police officers were rushed to the scene and initiated life-saving measures for the 21-year-old, who had sustained multiple gunshot wounds. She was then transported to Canton Potsdam Hospital, where she ultimately died about an hour later. Investigators quickly identified local man Michael J. Snow as the prime suspect in Howell's murder. The following day, police conducted a raid of the 31-year-old's residence, which resulted in the alleged killer being taken into custody. As indicated by court records, Snow was subsequently charged with second-degree murder. It wasn't immediately known whether he'd had a pre-existing relationship with the victim, but SUNY Potsdam did issue a statement in which they claimed that the man had no affiliation with the college, either as a student, employee, or graduate. Howell, who performed with the Crane Symphony Orchestra as a cellist, was in her final semester at the university at the time of her tragic death. Number 1. Tyler Lopresti Castro Shortly before 7 a.m. on January the 27th, of 2022, a pair of Wanonta public transit employees came upon the frozen, lifeless body of a local college student near the intersection of Interstate 88 and Route 205. Emergency medical personnel attempted to resuscitate the young man, but he was ultimately pronounced dead. After being taken to A.O. Fox Memorial Hospital, the authorities were able to identify him as 20-year-old Tyler Lopresti Castro by using the SUNY Wanonta student ID card that was found in his possession. Local police determined that Lopresti Castro had left the party at around midnight on January the 27th and began walking home alone. A witness claimed to have seen a man matching Lopresti Castro's description walking along an I-88 exit ramp at about 1 a.m. The young man was later captured by the security camera at the Silas Lane Transit Garage, where his body was ultimately found. It was reported that Lopresti Castro had unspecified levels of alcohol and caffeine in his system at the time of his death. Investigators found no evidence of criminal activity or foul play in connection to the student's untimely passing. Number 8. Julio Nivello one of the most brazen thefts to have occurred in New York in recent history was carried out by Julio Nivello in 2016. The man had been a Korea thief ever since he'd come to the city from Ecuador in the late 1980s. He started with electronics before moving on to jewelry. As a result of his crimes, Nivello was deported to his native country four times between 1994 and 2008. He would make his way back to New York using aliases and fake passports. In September of 2016, he saw an opportunity to seize what he'd later describe as the Super Bowl of thefts. He spotted a large gold-filled bucket in the back of an armored truck in Manhattan. While the two guards were distracted, Nivello approached the back of the truck and then made off with over 90 pounds of gold. He would later state that the theft took him less than 10 seconds. Security cameras captured Nivello as he struggled to carry the heavy bucket down the busy Manhattan streets in broad daylight. After he took the loot to safety, Novello realized that he had in his possession two massive gold bars, each about a foot long. He was able to quickly secure deals and converted the gold to roughly $1.6 million in cash. Even though the videos of the heist had started circulating around the world, Novello managed to flee the US and reach Ecuador. He'd reportedly made plans with his then fiance to send him the rest of his money once he got settled. According to Novello, the woman only sent him $50,000. What happened to the rest remains a mystery, but Novello believes that his fiancée and her new lover had kept the cash in spite of her claims that the police had seized it. 
Novella was eventually captured by undercover Ecuadorian officers, but wasn't extradited to the US. Because he had a good record in his home country, he spent less than a year in jail. His notoriety as the golden boy would ultimately condemn him to a life of paranoia in Ecuador. He feared being robbed or killed for the famed fortune that, according to him, he no longer possessed. Number 7. 303 East 51st Street Crane Collapse On March the 15th of 2008, a crane collapse in Manhattan resulted in the death of seven people. The incident occurred while a skyscraper was being built at 303 East 51st Street. Workers were attaching tower sections, meant to extend a 200-foot crane upwards. It's a procedure that's commonly referred to as jumping the crane. A steel collar meant to tie the crane to the skyscraper at the 18th floor fell as the crew was attempting to install it. A chain reaction ensued. A collar at the 9th floor, which served as a major anchoring point, also failed. A subsequent investigation would determine that the crew had used only half the amount of polyester slings recommended to keep the collar in place. As the collar fell, it damaged others in the lower levels. Left without any lateral support, the crane toppled. It landed on a four-story residential building opposite to it, causing considerable damage. Mayor Michael Bloomberg referred to the crane collapse as the worst construction accident in New York's recent history. Aside from the fatalities, at least 24 other people were injured. Number 6. Erica Tishman In December of 2019, a New York City architect was killed by a chunk of fallen masonry while walking down 729 7th Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. 60-year-old Erica Tishman's office was only a few blocks from the building. The mother of three was struck by debris that had fallen from over a dozen stories and was pronounced dead at the scene. The 17th-story building dated back to 1915, and as recently as October, inspectors had noted damaged terracotta in its upper floors, which represented a fall-in hazard for the busy street below. The Department of Buildings had determined the structure to be a Class 1 violation, meaning that the owners were advised to urgently correct the issue. In spite of the professional assessment, the sidewalk sheds meant to protect pedestrians never went up. Scaffolding was hastily mounted on the building only after Tishman's death. There's an ongoing lawsuit filed by her widower against the city and the building's owners. It alleges they were aware of the risks months prior to the incident, but had done nothing to mend the situation. Number 5. Lance Margolin in April of 2021, a 59-year-old man was fatally struck by a falling pole in Brooklyn. Lance Margolin, accompanied by his wife and a few of their friends, was returning from a birthday party shortly after 7 p.m. Around the same time, a Metropolitan Transportation Authority bus was navigating around a disabled vehicle and in the process hit a pole. Margolin's friends heard a loud bang and they'd initially thought that the man's wife had been hit by the vehicle. As they ran over, they saw Margolin with the pole lying on top of him. One of his friends managed to lift it, and Margolin was subsequently rushed to a hospital. Unfortunately, his injuries proved too severe and he passed away within a few days. The MTA bus driver was suspended, pending an internal investigation. Number 4. Karina Vetrano In early August of 2016, New York woman Karina Vetrano disappeared after she'd gone for a run in Spring Creek Park. Vetrano usually ran with her father, but he couldn't join her due to a back injury. He'd expressed concerns about her going out alone. After multiple call and texts had gone unanswered, Vetrano's father put together a search party. At around 11 p.m., he found her body face down about 15 feet from the trail. She'd been abused and strangled to death. Her neck had been squeezed so tightly that there was a palm print on her neck. Her panties and sports bra had been pulled down and she was covered in scratches and bruises. There was also evidence that she'd been struck in the back of the head with a rock. 30-year-old Vetrano had put up a ferocious fight, biting her attacker so hard that there were stress cracks in her teeth. The DNA of her attacker was found on her back, under her fingernails, and on her phone, which was recovered several feet away from her body. Hundreds of DNA samples were examined in the ensuing investigation but the police were initially unsuccessful in finding a suspect. It took six months before the DNA from the crime scene was matched with that of 20-year-old Chanel Lewis. He lived in a low-income housing neighborhood in East New York, less than three miles from the park where Vetrano had been found dead. Lewis didn't have a criminal record, but was described as being mentally unstable and harboring feelings of hatred towards women. 
while still in school a few years prior. He reportedly told a teacher's aide that he wanted to stab all the girls. The night of Vetrano's murder, he'd returned home looking disheveled with a hand injury, as well as cuts and scratches on his upper body. Lewis told his family he'd been mugged by a group of men, but there was no evidence of such an attack. During Lewis's trial, a forensic biologist claimed that the chance of someone else sharing his DNA profile was one in six trillion. In April of 2019, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number three, Robert Martinez. In 2018, a civilian working for the New York City Police Department was killed in a freak freeway accident involving a loose tire. 64-year-old Robert Martinez, who worked in building maintenance at the NYPD headquarters in Manhattan, was driving his Chevy Tracker on the Gowanus Expressway in Brooklyn. A rear tire from a garbage truck traveling in the opposite direction somehow became unhinged and flew over the center median. It hit Martinez's windshield, shattering it and causing him to crash into the divider. The emergency services found him unresponsive and rushed him to a New York University Langone Hospital. Martinez had suffered extensive head trauma to which he eventually succumbed while hospitalized. Number two, Jared Woodbury. In January of 2020, 42-year-old Jared Woodbury turned himself in at the Manhattan Criminal Court, admitting that he was the man responsible for a string of recent robberies. Perhaps the most shocking aspect was that Woodbury had actually been arrested in the midst of his spree. Woodbury's MO involved handing notes to bank tellers in Brooklyn and Manhattan demanding money. After his fourth heist, Woodbury had been arrested but promptly released without bail on January the 8th. That's because on January the 1st, new bail reform legislation had taken effect which barred judges from setting bail for non-violent offenders. Sources claim that as he was gathering his belongings from the NYPD headquarters, Woodbury had expressed bewilderment and said, I can't believe they let me out. Woodbury went on to rob two more banks, one of them less than four hours after his release. Even after he'd turned himself in and despite the obvious risk, there was still no legal grounds to hold him on bail under the new legislation. That's because he hadn't used a weapon or exhibited violence during his crimes. However, because one of the banks Woodbury had robbed was federally insured, federal prosecutors took control of the case. Unlike state legal authorities, they had the power to hold him. Woodbury thus faced federal bank robbery charges which held a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. Number 1. Visaya Hoffi On January the 11th of 2020, an Australian tourist suffered an horrific accident at the 14th Street Pass Station. 23-year-old Visaya Hoffi from Brisbane had tripped and fallen onto the tracks at around 4 a.m. She was wearing a dark puffy jacket and black jeans which made her virtually invisible to the conductor of an oncoming train. Hoffi was run over by all seven cars. 20 minutes after Hoffi's body had been left mangled on the tracks, another train was approaching. Fortunately, the woman's bright pink shirt had been exposed, making her more visible and the conductor was able to stop in time. She was taken to Bellevue Hospital with head trauma and devastating injuries to her lower body. Hoffi had multiple surgeries that included the amputation of both her legs. The fact that she survived after being run over by a train was described as miraculous. According to the latest updates on her condition, the young woman had returned to Australia where she continued her recovery. Number 7. Richard Chavez 20-year-old nursing student Charisma Oreshman was reported missing after being last seen leaving her Forest View home on January the 23rd of 2022. Several days later, she was found unresponsive and with a jacket covering her face in the backseat of a car in the 5900 block of West Iowa Street. A restman was pronounced dead at the scene and the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office ruled it a homicide by strangulation and smothering. A police investigation revealed 24-year-old Richard Chavez as the primary suspect in her killing. Cell phone records indicated that he and a restman had been talking online and that the young woman had driven to his Oak Park home on January the 23rd. A private surveillance camera recorded him walking on the sidewalk at about 10.40 p.m. and going inside with a restman. She wasn't seen leaving the residence and the following morning, Chavez drove her car to the location where it was subsequently found. He then called his brother to give him a lift less than a mile away. After he was taken into custody, Chavez told the police that he and a restman had had consensual relations and that she'd left his home by the time he woke up. 
While he was being detained, the man phoned his parents in a recorded call telling them to get his passport ready. The case is ongoing and as of the latest updates, Chavez had been denied bail. Number 6. Antonio Alvarez Bodies of 30-year-old Illinois State Police Trooper Antonio Alvarez and his wife, Amanda Alvarez Callo, aged 31, were found in a parked car of Chicago's Southside in January of 2022. Both were pronounced dead at the scene from gunshot wounds to the head. As reported by the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office, Amanda's death was ruled a homicide, while the gunshot that had ended Antonio's life appeared to have been self-inflicted. The trooper, a three-year veteran of the force, and his wife, who worked as a school teacher at Matthew Gallistel Learning Academy, had been having marital problems and were separated. Relatives told the authorities that Amanda had stated plans of leaving her husband and starting a new chapter. It's believed that she'd shared her resolve with Antonio, who then shot her before turning the weapon, which was subsequently recovered from the vehicle on himself. The couple were survived by two young children aged one and four, who were placed in the care of relatives in the tragedy's aftermath. Number 5. Carlton Weekly While shopping in the upscale Gold Coast community on August the 4th of 2020, rapper FBG Duck was shot multiple times in an attack carried out in broad daylight. The 26-year-old rapper known as Carlton Weekly, which was his real name, sustained injuries to the groin, chest and neck. A video circulated on social media in the shooting's wake showed a man in a blue tracksuit believed to be weakly lying face down on the street with two officers near him. The bystander who'd taken the video was heard saying, they shot FBG Duck in the audio of the footage. The rapper who was part of the Flyboy Gang and signed to Sony Records was left in critical condition. He was rushed to Northwestern Memorial Hospital where he was later pronounced dead. Two others, a 26-year-old woman and a man in his mid-30s were severely injured in the shooting but was subsequently reported to have survived. A federal indictment was unsealed in October of 2021, and it revealed the names of the five men who'd been taken into custody and charged with murder in connection to the incident. Aged 22 to 30, they were reported members of the O-Block Street Gang, who violently protected its territories on the South Side and claimed responsibility for various acts of violence in the city. Weekly, who often rapped about gun violence, was allegedly affiliated with a rival gang. The authorities reported he'd made derogatory statements about O-Block, which was identified as a possible motive behind the shooting. According to the indictment, Charles Liggins, Kenneth Roberson, Tarkalos Offord, Christopher Thomas and Marcus Smart emerged from two vehicles and fired approximately 38 shots at Weekly. The men were charged with committing murder in aid of racketeering, assault in the aid of racketeering and various weapons charges. If the reputed gangsters were found guilty, they faced a minimum sentence of life in prison or the death penalty. Number 4. Tremont Hill In January of 2019, a student athlete at Phillips High School was charged with murder in the death of a transgender escort with whom he'd been having an intimate relationship. On August the 30th of 2018, Tremont Hill, a high school basketball star and father of one, Lord Dejane Stanton to a secluded area in the 4,000 block of South Calumet Avenue in Bronzeville. It was there that the teenager was alleged to have fatally shot 24-year-old Stanton in the head. In the aftermath, the police analyzed texts exchanged between the two starting on July the 22nd. Hill had lied that he was 18 years old and told Scranton that he was interested in a physical relationship with her. Later that same day, they met at a Southside hotel and had intercourse. Subsequent communication between them underlined an inner conflict on Hill's part, stemming from Scranton being a transgender woman. The 17-year-old told her that he'd been having thoughts of self-harm since their last encounter. They arranged the August 30th meeting where Hill allegedly killed his former lover in cold blood. A search warrant served at the teen's home turned up a shirt and pants matching those seen on surveillance video, and the clothing exhibited small bloodstains. Hill was charged as an adult and, if convicted, faced a sentence of life in prison while in the murder's aftermath, activists call for safety measures to prevent future violence against transgender women. Number 3. Kaylin Pryor 
A street in Chicago was renamed in the spring of 2022 to honor the memory of a young woman who had been gunned down roughly six years previously. 20-year-old Kaylin Pryor had just won a modeling contract out of 500 competitors and was on the verge of a promising career before her life was cut short in November of 2015. She'd grown up in Evanston and was on her way to catch a bus after visiting her grandmother in Englewood. Someone opened fire from a passing SUV and the young woman, who wasn't believed to have been the intended target, was shot and killed. No suspects were ever arrested and the model's murder remained unsolved as of the latest updates. In April of 2022, family and friends returned to 74th and South Main Street corner to unveil a sign dedicated to Pryor. In the years since her passing, the victim's father, Alan Scott, devoted his life to anti-violence causes. He expressed hopes that the sign would renew interest in Pryor's case, reminding people there was a $30,000 reward for the arrest and conviction of her killer. Number two, Londra Sylvester. In July of 2021, moments after being released from the Cook County Jail, a local drill rapper was ambushed and shot numerous times. 31-year-old Londre Sylvester, who went by the stage name KTS Dre, died after suffering up to 64 gunshot wounds all over his body. Sylvester had walked out of the jail and towards a vehicle which had been waiting for him when unidentified shooters pulled up in two cars and unleashed a hail of bullets on him. A 60-year-old woman who was accompanying the rapper was shot in the knee while a second woman, who was passing through the area, was grazed by a bullet in the mouth. Both victims were reported as being in good condition after receiving medical attention. A processing photo from the Cork County Sheriff's showed Sylvester with a series of prominent tattoos across his body, including a target symbol on his neck, alongside the phrase, kill to survive. He'd been detained for violation of a bail bond after allegedly failing to meet conditions of his release in a 2020 felony gun case. It's unclear if the brutal ambush had been gang-related, a personal vendetta, or some other form of retaliation, and as per the latest information released to the media, no arrests had been made. Number 1. Chicago Rippers In the early 1980s, Robin Gecht, along with brothers Andrew and Thomas Cocorellis and Edward Spreitzer, carried out a series of horrific killings in Chicago and the broader Illinois area. Collectively known as the Chicago Rippers or the Ripper Crew, they abused and mutilated women while they were still alive, as well as cannibalized and further desecrated their remains in death. They were reported to have taken sadistic pleasure in their crimes while operating as a satanic cult. At 30 years old, the group's eldest, Gecht, was identified as the leader and mastermind with one detective working on the case, later claiming that he made Manson look like a Boy Scout. The Rippers were suspected in the disappearances of 17 women and the unrelated random drive-by fatal shooting of 28-year-old drug dealer Rafael Terrado, their only male victim. Gecht and the others claimed their first victim on May the 23rd of 1981. They abducted 28-year-old Linda Sutton in their van and her lifeless body was found. Ten days later, in a field in Villa Park, Illinois, mutilated and with her left breast amputated. The Rippers claimed several more female victims in the Chicago area, using the same modus operandi, which involved kidnapping and subjecting them to ritualistic torture and abuse prior to killing them in ways that included strangling, stabbing, or shooting. On December the 6th, 20-year-old Beverly Washington, who'd become the Rippers' last victim, was found clinging to life by a railroad track. In addition to other injuries, her left breast had been amputated and her right breast was nearly cut off. She survived and gave a detailed description of her attackers in the van they'd used, which led to their arrest. Thomas Cocorilis confessed that he and the others had abducted women and taken them to Gecht's home, called a satanic chapel. It was there that the victims were ritualistically abused and had their breasts amputated with a wire garrote often while they were still alive. Cocorales reported that the men would then eat portions of the severed parts as a sacrament. Gecht was also reported to have pleasured himself in them before placing the body parts in a box in which Cocorales said he'd once seen over a dozen of them. The victims were then executed reportedly as Gecht read verses from the Satanic Bible. Gecht was the only one to maintain his innocence and was only convicted of attempted murder and other related charges stemming from Washington's non-fatal abuse and assault. Deemed a devil and monster by the presiding judge, 
He was sentenced to 120 years in prison and will be eligible for parole in 2042. Thomas Cocorellis was given a more lenient sentence for his cooperation and released in 2019 while his brother Andrew was executed via lethal injection in 1999 and was the last inmate to be executed in the state of Illinois before capital punishment was abolished in 2011. Spritzer, labeled by the prosecution as every woman's nightmare, was given a death sentence that was later commuted to life without parole. Number 7. Monique Bohr On the afternoon of December the 31st of 2019, 28-year-old Monique Bohr, a realtor from Minneapolis, Minnesota, received a call from someone interested in touring a house in Maple Grove. Bohr got there around 3 p.m., but no one else had arrived yet. A short while later, a U-Haul van pulled up to the house. An individual emerged from the vehicle, forced Bohr into the cargo area, and then drove away. Roughly two hours later, a masked gunman broke into the home that belonged to Bohr and her boyfriend, John Mitchell Moma. The intruder had used Bohr's key to get inside and proceeded to open fire on Mitchell Moma as he sat on the staircase. At the time of the shooting, his and Bohr's three-year-old child was sitting on the couch close by, and their one-year-old was asleep upstairs. Relatives showed up to the house soon after the shooting because it had been prearranged for them to look after the couple's children, while Bohr and her boyfriend were supposed to go out for New Year's Eve. It was then that they discovered Mitchell Moma with multiple gunshot wounds to his torso. He was rushed to the hospital and fortunately survived the incident. Later that night, three gunshots were heard being fired in an alley downtown. When the police arrived at the scene, they found Bohr's body. She had been bound by the hands and feet and shot dead with the same gun that was fired at her boyfriend earlier that evening. The ensuing investigation led to the arrests and convictions of multiple suspects. Cedric Lamont Berry and Berry Davis, both aged 42, were charged with first-degree murder and given life sentences for their part in Bohr's kidnapping and killing and the attempted killing of her boyfriend. Two other co-conspirators, 36-year-old Lyndon Wiggins and 29-year-old Elsa Segura, were handed down similar charges. Wiggins was sentenced to an additional 19 years in prison for drug trafficking. Wiggins was also found to have been the mastermind behind the plot. He had wanted to get back at Mitchell Moma over a soured record contract and enlisted the help of the three other perpetrators. Number 6. April Sorensen April Sorensen, aged 27, was an aspiring dental hygienist who lived with her husband Joshua in Rochester. On April the 17th of 2007, Sorensen went about her normal routine. She worked a part-time job in the morning and attended classes at a local community college. After returning home in the early afternoon, her day took a tragic turn. A cable technician was scheduled to show up at the house for a service call at around 12.30 p.m. Upon his arrival, however, he heard Sorensen's fire alarm blaring from inside and could see a haze of smoke from the window. He called 911 and firefighters were immediately dispatched to the scene. After extinguishing the blaze, the first responders discovered Sorensen's dead body lying on the bedroom floor. Investigators subsequently conducted a thorough examination of the premises, collecting hundreds of pieces of evidence to help them ascertain what exactly had transpired. An autopsy revealed that Sorensen had been strangled and stabbed to death prior to the fire being started. The authorities determined that the house fire was used by her killer to cover up the murder. There have been multiple suspects over the course of the police investigation, including the cable technician who called in the fire and Sorensen's husband, both of whom were swiftly cleared. The investigation has known little progress since. According to subsequent updates, a $25,000 reward has been offered to anyone with information leading to the murderer's capture. Number 5. America Thayer at around 2.30 p.m. on July the 28th of 2021, police officers in Shakopee, Minnesota, were notified of a stabbing that occurred in the middle of an intersection in a suburban neighborhood. When the authorities arrived at the scene, they discovered a human head and the headless body it was previously attached to lying on the road. The victim was identified as America Thayer, a 55-year-old Shakopee resident. She had been decapitated by a machete, which the police found discarded in a nearby recycling bin alongside a pile of bloody clothing. It wasn't long before investigators named the prime suspect in Thayer's brutal murder, Alexis Saborit, age 42. Saborit had been in a relationship with Thayer for seven years prior to the killing, and he was positively identified by multiple eyewitnesses. They found him wandering near the highway roughly two miles from the scene of the crime 
and he was apprehended without further incident. In conversations with police, Saborit admitted to beheading Thea after the woman expressed her intention to break up with him. Domestic violence had been an ongoing problem in the couple's contentious relationship, and Saborit had even been issued a restraining order in 2017 before Thea requested it be removed. On the day of the murder, Saborit was scheduled to appear in court on arson charges after he set fire to his own home. On August 9th of 2021, he was officially charged with second-degree murder for killing his girlfriend. Number 4. Lois Rice After shooting and killing her own husband, Lois Rice, a grandmother from Blooming Prairie, Minnesota, fled to Florida, where she murdered yet another victim in order to steal her identity, Rice who was 56 at the time, had gotten into an argument with her husband, David, on March the 11th of 2018. According to Rice's testimony to police, he had given her a loaded gun and told her to take her own life. Rice instead turned the weapon on him, firing multiple rounds into his chest. Upon realizing he was dead, she withdrew $10,000 from his bank account and went on the run. First, she escaped to Fort Myers Beach, Florida and began searching for a woman who looked enough like her that she could steal their identity. She decided on 59-year-old Pamela Hutchinson, whom she then befriended. On April the 6th, however, Florida police discovered Hutchinson's dead body inside a Fort Myers Beach hotel. The same gun that had taken David Rice's life had been used on Hutchinson as well. A nationwide hunt for Lois Rice began. She was eventually tracked down by U.S. Marshals, who found her in a restaurant in South Padre Island, Texas, on April the 19th. She was given a life sentence in Florida for murdering Hutchinson. In July of 2020, she was extradited back to Minnesota, where she stood trial for the murder of her husband. She apologized to her husband's family and friends as she admitted to killing him. She subsequently received a second life sentence. She will live out the remainder of her years behind bars in Minnesota. Number 3. Terry Brisk 41-year-old Terry Brisk of Little Falls, Minnesota, was expected to go into work on November the 7th of 2016, but instead, he was found dead on his parents' property. His parents were unaware that he'd taken the day off to go hunting on their land until they spotted his car parked outside. They decided not to disturb him, but when he failed to return from the wooded section of the property that they commonly use for hunting, the family set out to look for him. They were then met with a harrowing sight as Brisk had been shot dead while on his hunt, and his rifle was missing from the scene. Though investigators initially speculated that Brisk might have taken his own life, the missing rifle seemed to indicate that someone else had carried out the shooting and then fled with the murder weapon. The autopsy confirmed that another party was involved and the coroner ruled his death a homicide. Despite this discovery, the police struggled to identify any suspects in Brisk's murder. In May of 2021, having made no further progress in the case, the Morrison County Sheriff's Office brought in an outside investigator to aid them in their efforts to bring justice to Brisk's mystery killer. There was a 13-foot memorial stone placed near the area where his body was found on his parents' land. The victim was survived by a wife and four children. Number 2. Justin Damond 40-year-old Justin Damond's attempts to call on the Minneapolis Police Department for help would trigger a chain of events that led to her own demise. In the late hours of July the 15th of 2017, Damon placed two calls to 911. She reported what she believed to be a woman getting assaulted in an alley behind her house. The emergency dispatchers categorized the call as a low-priority tip, potentially because Damon was calling from the relatively low-crime neighborhood of Fulton. Eventually, two officers were dispatched to the scene. They were 31-year-old Mohammed Noor and his partner, Matthew Harity, aged 25. Noor was well known within the Minneapolis community for being one of the city's first Somali-American officers. The two policemen drove their squad car with its lights turned off down the alley Damon had described to the 911 operator. Upon arriving at the scene of the reported crime, they found nothing to suggest that there had been an attack. At that point, Nor documented in the police car's computer that the scene had been cleared and the two officers prepared to leave. Suddenly, the pair were startled by a loud noise coming from outside their vehicle. At that very moment, a barefoot Damon approached the squad car from the driver's side, further alarming the officers. They both drew their weapons and Harity kept his gun lowered, but Noor fired a single shot through the window, striking Damond in the midsection. The officers subsequently attempted CPR on the woman who was unconscious, but she passed away within minutes. Though Noor insisted in the ensuing criminal trial that he was simply acting in self-defense 
When he shot Damond, he was ultimately convicted of third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter in June of 2019. He successfully appealed the third-degree murder charge in the Minnesota Supreme Court on September the 15th of 2021. His initial prison sentence was 12 and a half years, but following his appeal, Nor was scheduled to be resentenced for the lesser manslaughter charge alone. Number 1. The Byron David Smith Murders Byron David Smith, aged 64, brutally killed two individuals attempting to burglarize his home in Little Falls, Minnesota. He had retired from a position at the U.S. State Department and lived alone at the time of the incident, which took place on Thanksgiving Day 2012. Smith's residence had been targeted multiple times in the months leading up to the incident, and he had consequently installed a security system in his house to catch the culprits. He also began regularly walking around his home with a loaded gun strapped to his waist. On the day of the killings, Smith had driven his car to a neighbor's home to give the burglars the impression that his house was empty. It wasn't long before 18-year-old Hailey Kaifer and her cousin Nicholas Brady, aged 17, broke into Smith's house with the intention of robbing it. Unbeknownst to them, they were walking into a trap that Smith had laid out for them. He was also inside the home, positioned in a dark corner with his firearm in hand. Smith then turned on a recording device to capture the events that followed. After lying in wait for 12 minutes, he fired two shots at Brady as he went down into the basement. The teen fell to the bottom of the stairs and as he lay wounded on the floor, Smith stood above his body and taunted him. He then fired an additional shot to Brady's head, killing him. Kaifer came looking for her cousin in the basement and was also shot by Smith while climbing down the stairs. She attempted to escape, but Smith shot her multiple times in the torso and the left side of her face, all the while gleefully insulting her. He then delivered the kill shot by discharging his gun into Kaifer's chin. The burglar's dead body sat in Smith's basement for an entire day before he called the police, an aspect he'd later tried to justify by claiming he didn't want to bother anyone on Thanksgiving. He was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder in court. Smith argued that his actions were justified under the Castle Doctrine, which allows homeowners to use lethal force in defense of their residence. The jury was not swayed, however, and he was sentenced to life in prison, with the recording captured by his own device playing a significant role in his conviction. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click on one of the links on your screen for more videos.